Order! Order! Before we come to the statement by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I would like to point out that a British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make a statement. Chancellor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, Mr Speaker, let me start directly with the issue most worrying the British people today, the cost of energy. People will have seen the horrors of Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. They will have heard reports that their already expensive energy bills could reach as high as £6,500 next year. Mr Speaker, we were never going to let this happen. My right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister has acted with great speed to announce one of the most significant interventions the British state has ever made. People need to know that help is coming, and help is indeed coming. We are taking three steps to support families and businesses with the cost of energy. Firstly, to help households, the energy price guarantee will limit the unit price that consumers pay for electricity and gas. This means that for the next two years, the typical annual household bill will be £2,500. For a typical household, that is a saving of at least £1,000 a year based on current prices. We are continuing our existing plans to give all households £400 off bills this winter. So taken together, Mr Speaker, we are cutting everyone's energy bills by an expected £1,400 this year, and millions of the most vulnerable households will receive additional payments, taking their total savings this year to £2,200. Secondly, as well as helping people, we need to support the businesses who employ them. The Energy Bill Relief Scheme will reduce wholesale gas and electricity prices for all UK businesses, charities and the public sector, such as schools and hospitals. This will provide a price guarantee equivalent to the one provided for households for all businesses across the country. Thirdly, energy prices are extremely volatile. Uh, rising and falling erratically every hour. This creates real risks to energy firms who are otherwise viable businesses. Those firms help supply the essential energy needed by households and businesses. So to support the market, we are announcing the Energy Markets Financing Scheme. Delivered with the Bank of England, this scheme will provide a 100% guarantee for commercial banks to offer emergency liquidity to energy traders. Mr Speaker. The consensus amongst independent forecasters is that the government's energy plan will reduce peak inflation by around five percentage points. It will reduce the cost of servicing index-linked government debt and lower wider cost of living pressures. And it will help millions of people and businesses right across the country with the cost of energy. Let no one doubt, Mr Speaker, that during the worst energy crisis in generations, this government is on the side of the British people. The Bank of England are taking further steps to control inflation, acting again only yesterday. And I can assure the House that this Government considers the Bank of England's independence to be sacrosanct. And we remain closely coordinated with the Governor and myself speaking twice a week. But, Mr Speaker, high energy costs are not the only challenge confronting this country. Growth is not as high as it should be. This has made it harder to pay for public services requiring taxes to rise. In turn, higher taxes on capital, higher taxes on labour have lowered returns on investment and work, reducing economic incentives and hampering growth still further. This cycle has led to the tax burden being forecast to reach the highest levels since the late 1940s, before before even Her Late Majesty acceded to the throne. We are determined, Mr Speaker, to break that cycle. We need a new approach for a new era focused on growth. Our aim over the medium term is to reach a trend rate of growth of 2.5 per cent. And our plan, Mr Speaker, is to expand the supply side of the economy through tax incentives and reform. That is how we will deliver higher wages 
greater opportunities and, crucially, Mr. Speaker, fund public services yeah. now and into the future. That is how we will compete successfully with dynamic economies around the world. And that is how, Mr. Speaker, we will turn this vicious cycle of stagnation into a virtuous cycle of growth. So, as a government, we will focus on growth even where that means taking difficult decisions. Now, none of this is going to happen overnight, but today, but today we are publishing our growth plan. Today we are publishing our growth plan that sets out a new approach for this new era built around three central priorities. Reforming the supply side of the economy, maintaining a responsible approach to public finance, and cutting taxes to boost growth. Mr Speaker, the UK today has the second lowest debt-to-GDP ratio of any G7 country. In due course, we will publish a medium-term fiscal plan setting out our responsible fiscal approach more fully, including how we plan to reduce debt as a percentage of GDP over the medium term. And the OBR, Mr Speaker, will publish a full economic and fiscal forecast before the end of the year, with a second to follow in the new year. Fiscal responsibility remains essential for economic confidence, and it is a path we are committed to. Today we are publishing <coughs> costings of all the measures the Government has taken, and those costings will be incorporated into the OBR's forecast in the usual way. The House should note that the estimated costs of our energy plans are particularly uncertain, given volatile energy prices, but based on recent prices, the total cost of the energy package for the six months from October is expected to be around £60 billion. We expect the cost to come down as we negotiate new long-term energy contracts with suppliers. And in the context of a global energy crisis, Mr. Speaker, it is entirely appropriate for the Government to use our borrowing powers to fund temporary measures in order to support families and businesses. That's exactly what we did during the COVID-19 pandemic. A sizeable intervention was right then, and it is right now. The price, the heavy price of inaction, would have been far greater than the cost of these schemes. Mr. Speaker, we are at the beginning of a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate, that's right, that's right, a new era, a new era, a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate this new era. We recognise, we recognise, Mr. Speaker, that there is huge potential in our country. We have unbounded entrepreneurial drive. We have highly skilled people. We have immense global presence in sectors like finance, like life sciences, technology, and clean energy. But, Mr. Speaker, there are too many barriers uh, for enterprise. We need a new approach to break them down, and that means reforming the supply side of our economy. Over the coming weeks, my Cabinet colleagues will update the House on every aspect of our ambitious agenda. Those updates will cover the planning system, business regulations, childcare, immigration, agricultural productivity and digital infrastructure. But, Mr Speaker, we start this work today. An essential foundation of growth is infrastructure. The roads, railways and networks that carry people goods and information all over our country. Today, our planning system for major infrastructure is too slow and fragmented. The time it takes to get consent for nationally significant projects is getting slower, not quicker, while, while Mr. Speaker, our international competitors forge ahead. We have to end this. We can announce that in the coming months we will bring forward a new bill to unpack, unpick the complex patchwork of planning restrictions and EU-derived laws that constrain our, our growth. We will streamline a whole host of assessments, of appraisals, of consultations, endless duplications and regulations. We will re also review the Government's business case process to speed up deci decision-making. And today, we are publishing a list of infrastructure projects that will be prioritised for acceleration in sectors like transport, energy and telecoms. And to increase housing supply and enable forthcoming planning reforms, we will also increase the disposal of surplus government land 
to build new homes. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are getting out of the way to get Britain building. One of the proudest achievements of our Conservative Government is that unemployment is at the lowest level for nearly 50 years. But with more vacancies than unemployed people to fill them, we need to encourage people to join the labour market. We will make work pay by reducing uh, people's benefits if they don't fulfil their job search commitments. We will provide extra support for unemployed over 50s and will ask around 120,000 more people on universal credit to take active steps to seek more and better paid work or face having their benefits reduced. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, at such a critical time for our economy, it is simply unacceptable. It is simply unacceptable that strike action is disrupting so many lives. Other European countries, other European countries have minimum service levels to stop militant trade unions closing down transport networks during strikes. So we will do the same and we will go further. We will legislate to require unions to put pay offers to a member vote to ensure that strikes can only be called once negotiations have genuinely broken down. And of course, Mr Speaker, to drive growth, we need new sources of capital investment. To this end, I can announce that we will accelerate reforms to the pension charge cap so that it will no longer apply to well-designed performance fees. This will unlock pension fund investments into UK assets and innovative high-growth businesses. It will benefit, it will benefit Mr Speaker, savers and increased growth. And we will provide up to £500 million to support new innovative funds and attract billions of additional uh, pounds into UK science and technology scale-ups. Now, Mr Speaker, this brings me to the cap on bankers' bonuses. A strong UK economy has always depended on a strong financial services sector. We need global banks to create jobs here, invest here, and pay taxes here in London. In London. Not in Paris, not in Frankfurt, and not in New York. All the bonus cap did was to push up the basic salaries of bankers or drive activity outside Europe. It never capped, it never capped total remuneration. So let's not hear and sit here and pretend otherwise. It didn't cap uh, uh, total remuneration. So as a consequence of this, Mr Speaker, we are going to get rid of it. Yeah. And to reaffirm, and to reaffirm, and to reaffirm, we're going to get rid of it. And to reaffirm, and to reaffirm the UK's status as the world's financial services centre, I will set out an ambitious package of regulatory reforms later in the autumn. But, Mr. Speaker, to support growth right across the country, we need to go further with targeted action in local areas. So today, I can announce the creation of new investment zones. We will liberalise planning rules in specified agreed sites, releasing land and accelerating development. And, Mr Speaker, we will cut taxes. For businesses in designated tax sites for 10 years, there will be accelerated tax reliefs for structures and buildings and 100% tax relief on qualifying investments in plants and machinery. On purchases of land and buildings for commercial or new residential development, there will be no stamp duty to pay whatsoever. On newly occupied business premises, there will be no business rates to pay whatsoever. And if a business hires a new employee in the tax site, then on the first £50,000 they earn, the employer will pay no national insurance whatsoever. That is an unprecedented set of tax incentives for business, Mr Speaker, to invest, to build and to create jobs right across the country. I can confirm to the House that we're in early discussions with nearly 40 places like Tees Valley, the West Midlands, Norfolk and the West of England to establish investment zones. And we'll work with the developed administrations and local partners 
to make sure that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will also benefit if they are willing to do so. If we really, if we really want to level up, Mr Speaker, if we really want to level up, Mr Speaker, we have to unleash the power of the private sector. And now, Mr Speaker, now, Mr Speaker, we come, we come to tax, central to solving the riddle of growth. The tax system is not simply about raising revenue for public services, vitally important though that is. Tax determines the incentives across our whole economy. And we believe that high taxes reduce incentives to work, they deter investment and they hinder enterprise. As my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has said, we will review the tax system to make it simpler, more dynamic and fairer for families, and we are taking that first step today. Mr Speaker, the interests of businesses are not separate from the interests of individuals and families. In fact, it is businesses that employ most people in this country. It is businesses that invest in the products and services we rely on. Every additional tax on business is ultimately passed through to families through higher prices, lower pay or lower returns on savings. So I can therefore confirm that next year's planned increase in corporation tax will be cancelled. The corporation tax rate will not rise to 25 per cent. It will remain at 19 per cent, and we will have the lowest rate of corporation tax in the G20. This will plough almost £19 billion a year back into the economy. That's £19 billion for businesses to reinvest, create jobs, raise wages, or pay the dividends that support our pensions. I have already taken steps elsewhere in this statement to support financial services, so the bank surcharge will remain at 8 per cent. But, Mr Speaker, we will do more to encourage private investment. The annual investment allowance, which gives 100 per cent tax relief on investments in plant and machinery, will not fall to £200,000 as planned. It will remain at a million pounds, and it will do so permanently. Our duty, our duty, Mr Speaker, is to make the UK one of the most competitive economies in the world, and we are delivering. We will deliver on this. Mr Speaker, we want this country to be an entrepreneurial, share-owning democracy. The Enterprise Investment Scheme, the Venture Capital Trust, we will extend beyond 2025. The Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, company share option plans, we will increase the limits to make them more generous. Crucial steps on the road to making this a nation of entrepreneurs. For the tax system to favour growth, Mr Speaker, it needs to be much simpler. I'm hugely grateful to the Office of Tax Simplification for everything they have achieved since 2010. But instead of a single arm's length body, which is separate from the Treasury and HMRC, we need to embed tax simplification into the heart of government. Yep. That is why, Mr Speaker, I have decided to wind down the Office of Tax Simplification and mandated every one of my tax officials to focus on simplifying our tax code. Yeah. To achieve a simpler system, I will start by removing unnecessary costs for business. Firstly, we will automatically sunset EU regulations by December 2023, requiring departments to review, replace or repeal retained EU law. This will reduce burdens on business, improve growth and restore the primacy of UK legislation. Mr Speaker, we can also simplify the IR35 rules, and we will. In practice, reforms to off-payroll working have added unnecessary complexity and cost for many businesses. So, as promised by my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, we will repeal the 2017 and 2021 reforms. Of course, of course, we will continue to keep compliance closely under review. Mr Speaker, Britain welcomes millions of tourists every year, and I want our high streets and airports, our ports and our shopping centres to feel the economic benefit. So we have decided to introduce VAT-free shopping for overseas visitors. We will replace the old paper-based system with a modern digital one, and this will be in place as soon as possible. This is a priority for our great British retailers, so it is our priority too. Our drive to modernise also extends to alcohol duties. 
I have listened to industry concerns about the ongoing reforms. I will therefore introduce an 18-month transitional measure for wine duty. I will also extend draft relief to cover smaller, to cover smaller kegs of 20 litres and above to help smaller breweries. And at this difficult time, we are not going to let alcohol duty rates rise in line with RPI. So I can announce that the planned increases in the duty rates for beer, for cider, for wine and for spirits will all be cancelled. Now, Mr Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, we come to the question of personal taxation. It is an important principle that people should keep more of the money they earn. And it is good policy, Mr. Speaker, to boost the incentives for work and enterprise. Yesterday, we introduced a bill that means the health and social care levy will not begin next year. It will be cancelled. The increase in employer national insurance contributions and dividends tax will be cancelled, and the interim increase in the national insurance rate brought in for this tax year will also be cancelled. And this cut, this cut will take effect from the earliest possible moment, November the 6th. Reversing the levy delivers a tax cut for 28 million people, Mr. Speaker, worth on average £330 every year, a tax cut for nearly a million businesses, and I can confirm the additional funding for the NHS and social care services will be maintained at the same level. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I have another measure. Today's statement is about growth. Home ownership is the most common route for people to own an asset, giving them a stake in the success of our economy and society. So, support, so to support growth, increase confidence and help families aspiring to own their own home, I can announce that we are cutting stamp duty. In the current system, there is no stamp duty to pay on the first £125,000 of a property's value. We are doubling that to £250,000. First-time buyers currently pay no stamp duty on the first £300,000. We are increasing that threshold as well to £425,000. And we are going to increase the value of the property on which first-time buyers can claim relief from £500,000 to £625,000. The steps we have taken today mean that 200,000 more people will be taken out of paying stamp duty altogether. This is a permanent cut, Mr Speaker, to stamp duty effective from today. I have another measure, Mr Speaker. I have another measure. High tax rates damage Britain's competitiveness. They reduce the incentive to work, to invest and to start a business. And the higher the tax, the more ways people seek to avoid them or work elsewhere or simply work less rather than putting their time and effort to more creative and productive ends. Take the additional rate of income tax. At 45 per cent, it is currently higher than the headline top rate in G7 countries like the US and Italy. And it is even higher than social democracies like Norway. But I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. From April the 23rd, we will have a, high, a single higher rate of income tax of 40 per cent. This will simplify the tax system and make Britain more competitive. It will reward enterprise and work. It will incentivise growth. It will benefit the whole economy and the whole country. And Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, after all, after all, this only returns us this only returns us to the top rate we had for 20 years, including the entire time the opposition was last in power. For one month. For one month. And that's not all. I can announce today that we will cut the basic rate of income tax to 19 pence in April 2023, one year early. That means a tax cut for over 31 million people in just a few months' time. This means that we will have one of the most competitive and pro-growth income tax systems in the world. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, for too long in this country we have indulged in a fight over redistribution. Now we need to focus on growth, not just how we tax 
and spend. We won't apologise for managing the economy in a way that increases prosperity and living standards. Our entire focus is on making Britain more globally competitive, not losing out to our competitors abroad. The Prime Minister promised that we would be a tax-cutting government. Today, we have cut stamp duty. We have allowed businesses to keep more of their own money to invest, to innovate and to grow. We have cut income tax and national insurance for millions of workers. We are securing up our place in a fiercely competitive global economy with lower rates of corporation tax and lower rates of personal tax. We promised to prioritise growth, Mr Speaker. We promised a new approach for a new era. We promised to release the enormous potential of this country. Our growth plan has delivered all those promises and more, Mr Speaker, and I commend it to the House. Order, order. Before I call the Shadow Chancellor, I inform the Honourable and Right Honourable Members that at the end of questions on the statement, I will call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move a provisional collection of taxes motion. Copies of the motion are being made available in the vote office. I now call the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to welcome the Right Honourable Gentleman to his place. Can I thank the Chancellor on his comprehensive demolition of the record of the last 12 years? Their record, their failure, their vicious circle of stagnation. The Chancellor has confirmed that the costs of the energy price cap will be funded by borrowing, leaving the eye-watering windfall profits of the energy giants untaxed. The oil and gas producers will be toasting the Chancellor in the boardrooms as we speak, while working people are left to pick up the bill. Borrowing higher than it needs to be, just as interest rates rise. And yet the Chancellor refuses to allow independent economic forecasts to be published, which would show the impact of this borrowing on our public finances, on growth and on inflation. It is a budget without figures, a menu without prices. Speaker, what has the Chancellor got to hide? This statement is an admission of 12 years of economic failure. And now here we are, one last throw of the dice, one last claim that these ministers will be different. (laughs) For all the chopping and changing, all the chaos and confusion, there has been one person there throughout, the Prime Minister. She's been a minister for a decade and defended every single economic decision. So when the Prime Minister says she wants to break free from the past, (laughs) what she really means to say is that she wants to break free from her own failed record. Because where have the last 12 years left us? Lower growth, lower investment, lower productivity, and today we learn that we have the lowest consumer confidence since records began. The only things that are going up are inflation, interest rates and bankers' bonuses. And borrowing. And borrowing. As as the Tories become more and more detached from reality, millions of people, millions of our constituents, are lying awake at night, worried about how they're going to make ends meet. Labour won the argument that action on energy bills was necessary. But the question is, the question is, who pays? The energy producers who have profited so much from the rises in prices should make a contribution. But when the country asked who should fit the bill for their energy rescue package, the Conservatives responded, you the British people. Instead of standing up for working people, the Conservatives chose to shield the gigantic windfall profits of the energy giants, leaving tens of billions of pounds on the table and pushing all of the costs onto government borrowing, to be paid for by current and future taxpayers. The Prime Minister and Chancellor have no regard for taxpayers' interests or for the concerns of working people. It's not just the Conservative Party is not working for ordinary families, it is actively working against them. 
Mr Speaker, we have had six so-called plans for growth from the Conservatives since 2010. Here they are, Mr Speaker, a litany of failure, every single one of them. Now, I do at least commend the Chancellor on having the ambition of achieving 2.5% growth a year, the last Labour government's rate of economic growth. But to achieve that sort of growth, and for that sort of growth to be sustainable, you need a credible plan. And the truth is that this government does not have one. The Prime Minister and Chancellor are like two desperate gamblers in a casino chasing a losing run. The argument peddled by the Chancellor today isn't a great new idea or a game changer, as the Minister said, as much as he'd like us to think so. What this plan adds up to is to keep corporation tax where it is today and take national insurance contributions back to where they were in March. Some new new plan. And it's all based based on an outdated ideology that says if we simply reward those who are already wealthy, the whole of society will benefit. They've decided to replace levelling up with trickle down. As President Biden said this week, He is sick and tired of trickle-down economics, and he is right to be. It is discredited, it is inadequate, and it will not unleash the wave of investment that we need. Mr Speaker, it is not just those on this side of the House who have these concerns. The Right Honourable Member for Surrey Heath described the Prime Minister's economic plans as taking a holiday from reality. The Right Honourable Member for Richmond, that was two Chancellors ago, was perhaps perhaps too honest with his party. He said, we have tried having a low corporation tax as a means of getting business to invest, but that it has not worked. Now, the new Chancellor and the new Prime Minister used to agree with that. Indeed, they voted for it. (laughs) Labour supported it too. Members opposite might have changed their minds, but we have not, because the evidence shows that low rates of corporation tax are not the best way to boost investment and productivity, and the Tories' own record shows that. Britain has the lowest headline rate of corporation tax in the G7, but we also have the lowest rate of business investment in the G7. That's why Labour would do what businesses are actually asking for using targeted investment allowances to boost productivity and growth, and scrapping outdated and unfair business rates that harm our high streets and small businesses, replacing them with a system that's fit for the 21st century. And what about their other policies? Let's take the so-called investment zones. Again, these are nothing new. Every time they were tried, all they have achieved was moving growth around the country, not creating it. The best way out of the high-tax, low-growth spiral that the Conservatives have created is to get the economy firing on all cylinders in all parts of the country. It's going to take much more, much more than a stamp duty cut to get our country back on track. And home ownership back to the levels last seen under a Labour government. Now, these stamp duty changes have been tried before. Last time the government did it, a third of the people who benefited were buying a second home, a third home, or a buy-to-let property. Is that really the best use of taxpayers' money when borrowing and debt are already so high? And can the Chancellor confirm today how much of this stamp duty cut will go to those purchasing multiple properties? Instead of stamp duties going up and down like a yo-yo, we need to get building. We need to target support at first-time buyers and tackle the issue of homes being sold to overseas investors. The Chancellor has made clear who his priorities are today. Not a plan for growth, a plan to reward the already wealthy, a return to the trickle-down of the past, back to the future, not a brave new era. The Chancellor and Prime Minister proclaimed in Britannia Unchained that 
the British are among the worst idlers in the world. Yeah. And to prove that they mean it, yeah. instead of supporting working people, this government is cutting their rights at work. Working people are the backbone of Britain and they should be respected, not sneered at. Labour will always stand up for their rights. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor has in effect today admitted he has broken his own fiscal rules. This is now the tenth time that the Tories have broken their own fiscal rules, something I'm sure that the Office for Budget Responsibility would have confirmed if they had been allowed to publish their forecasts today. Mr Speaker, it is unprecedented to have a fiscal statement of this scale with no independent forecasts from the Office for Budget Responsibility. Never has a government borrowed so much and explained so little. Economic institutions matter, yet this government has undermined the Bank of England sacked the respected permanent secretary yeah. at the Treasury yeah. and silenced the Office for Budget Responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. This is no way to build confidence. This is no way to build economic growth. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Labour believes in wealth creation. We will always support enterprise, creativity and hard work. We want British business to grow to be successful and to contribute to our country's prosperity. What we don't believe, as the Chancellor and Prime Minister do, is that British workers are idlers. Yeah. Yeah. We understand that it is the workers who turn up every day yeah. to make a great product at a factory or deliver a great service in the store who generate growth. It is the teachers giving the young people the skills they need the doctors and nurses keeping people well, the entrepreneur taking a personal risk to start a new business. These are the people who generate growth and they all deserve to share in it too. Mr Speaker, this statement is more than a clash of policies. It is a clash of ideas, two different ideas about how our country prospers. If you are a pensioner worried about the cost of living, A working family see your mortgage rate going up. A small business whose costs are spiralling. The government's announcements today do little to reassure them. Bigger bonuses for bankers, huge profits for energy giants, shamelessly shielded by Downing Street. And all the while, ministers pile the crushing weight of all of these costs onto the backs of taxpayers. The value of sterling sterling has fallen. We can see it. Half his colleagues suspect it. And financial markets know it. The verdict is clear. (coughs) When it comes to the economy, this Tory leadership do not know what they are doing. The Conservatives cannot solve the cost of living crisis. The Conservatives are the cost of living crisis. And our country cannot afford them any more. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was very interested to hear uh, the Right Honourable Lady's defence, and I was very curiously affected when she said that Labour believes in wealth creation. That was the biggest, that was the biggest fancy I've ever heard. You cannot, grow, you cannot grow, Mr Speaker, the economy if you keep taxing families. You cannot grow the economy. You cannot grow the economy if you see business as the enemy. We have to reiterate very clearly to our friends uh, on the opposite benches that you cannot tax your way to prosperity. You cannot help workers workers by increasing their taxes. And far from uh, uh, denigrating British workers, what our measures have done, what uh, what our measures have done is they are relieving they're relieving burdens on our workers yeah, yeah. and our people yeah, yeah, by yeah. energy intervening on energy prices and also relieving the burden of taxation. We've got to unshackle uh, the creative energies of this country, and that's what we're 100% focused yeah, on doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Stride. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I welcome uh, much in this uh, statement. There is uh, a great deal that will help millions of families and businesses 
up and down the country, but there is a vast void at the centre of the announcements that have been made this morning, and that is the lack of an independent OBR forecast. And at a time, Mr Speaker, when the markets are getting twitchy about government bonds, when the currency is under pressure, now is the time for transparency and making it very clear that whatever tax cuts or otherwise there may be, they are done in a fiscally responsible manner. And I have to say to my right honourable friend that he should have come forward with an OBR forecast and that we know as a committee, because of our correspondence with Richard Hughes, the head of the OBR, that the OBR was standing ready to come forward with just such a forecast. And we further know, because of that correspondence, that there is a forecast, a baseline forecast, that the Chancellor has at the moment and would have been on his desk when he first arrived in office. So could I now gently and respectfully ask him to release that forecast, to provide transparency to the House, to provide uh, a calmness to the markets and to do it without any further delay? Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, my right honourable friend, and I'd also like to gently and respectfully remind him that in the statement I committed in a, in a, in a very uh, categorical way to the OBR coming up with a forecast before, before uh, uh, the end of the calendar year. It will be a full forecast, it won't be a baseline forecast, and it will fully score the measures outlined in this growth plan. And I'd be very happy to meet him in his, com in his committee uh, at a time which is convenient. SNP spokesperson Alison Thoulis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chancellor comes here today, the sixth Chancellor in seven years, asking us to believe that the things that he voted for and supported just a few months ago were all fine at the time, but need completely reversed now. A new era, but they've been in government for 12 years. He stretches credibility beyond breaking point, saying that tax cuts for the rich, whopping bonuses for the bankers, and low corporation tax for companies will somehow refloat magically Britain's no. sinking economy. No, he won't. has no evidence, and this is no plan for growth. It is budget measures with no OBR assessment ducking scrutiny time and time again. It is a plan, Mr Speaker, for recession, for debt on an unsustainable trajectory and almost inevitable public sector cuts to come. Actively choosing to permanently cut taxes and spend eye-watering sums to patch up a failed energy market while inflation soars, interest rates are hiked and recession looms will not create growth. It will create economic chaos. Nothing he has said today will provide any reassurance and give hope to ordinary people, folks struggling to get by in broke, broken Britain. Families unable to put food on the table and heat their homes, punished by the Tory benefit cap and the two-child limit. These policies are driving up child poverty, and the Chancellor should be scrapping them, not the bankers' bonus cap. Indebted households already struggling to pay their mortgages in debt. A stamp duty cut is not going to help. It's going to overheat that housing market even more. Mr Speaker, disabled people and carers are terrified the electricity will run out. Pensioners are scared to turn on the heating. <coughs> the energy price caps should not go up. It's already too high, and people must get more help now. Asylum seekers and people stuck on no recourse to public funds are forced to get by on a pittance, and there was nothing whatsoever for them from this Chancellor. Mr Speaker, community organisations like Glasgow Central Mosque face additional energy bills of hundreds of thousands of pounds, which is a charity they just cannot afford. People depend on community organisations like the mosque, and they are being asked to be on the front line this winter. Even with the six-month reprieve in energy prices, these bills will not go away. Would the Chancellor have the mosque close their elderly daycare service, or the counselling provision, the mother and toddler group, the poverty reduction work, or the vaccination centre that has been running in the community hall? These are very real choices communities are already having to make. The businesses I have been listening to over the past months are incredibly worried for the future. They were already facing severe pressure through supply chain costs, input costs, labour costs, <laughs> COVID debts and Brexit woes before energy prices soared. Now they don't know how they will survive. Six months will go by in a flash and the question remains, what then? What then, from the Chancellor? Companies can't wash away, wish away these bills. The eye-wateringly eye unaffordable contracts they are being forced to sign right now. What happens to those businesses who just miss the arbitrary cut-off? And what of the increase in standing charges, which we already know are disproportionately high 
in Scotland. Mr Speaker, Scotland is an energy rich country, but we don't have the power. Scotland's renewable sector is booming, but in off-gas grid rural Scotland, surrounded by the wind turbines generating clean green energy, people are having to spend an absolute fortune in heating oil. In Argyll and Butte, in Angus, the Highlands and Islands and across our rural communities, households face increases of over 230% in the past two years alone. The UK Government's offer of £100 is nothing short of an insult as people turn to credit cards to fill up their fuel tanks. The Scottish Government is doing all in its power to support people through this crisis, strengthening the safety net by increasing the Scottish Child Payment to £25 a week, doubling the Fuel Insecurity Fund to £20 million and freezing rents because renters are also facing pressures. We have the highest rate of the real living wage in Scotland. We have invested in tackling fuel poverty and energy efficiency. But we could do so much more with more budget and more powers. At the back of the Blue Book today, still no carbon capture and storage for the north east of Scotland, a game changer for renewables in Scotland. Where is that in the Chancellor's plans? Nowhere again. We could have growth by investing in skills, in net zero and productivity. The Chancellor's plans will not do this. Mr. Speaker, people don't freeze to death in our Nordic neighbours. And people there are not living in one of the most unequal countries in the world, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. only getting worse. Yeah. This right-wing, Thatcher-cosplaying shambles of a government yeah, is making choices yeah, yeah, yeah. that they will never feel the consequences of. Mr Speaker, I beg of this Chancellor to listen to those on the edge, those who are desperately looking right now to him for a lifeline, but no one should have to beg for a decent standard of living. The people of Scotland see a Scottish Government doing their best to mitigate the worst, but stymied by the broken politics of this union and this economic madness we heard from the Chancellor today. Scotland is looking for a different path, Mr Speaker. Scotland needs independence. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what Scotland doesn't need is reheated socialism from the yeah. SNP. Yeah. Uh, she mentioned energy, and I was just, I'm always staggered when uh, people on, in her party mention energy, yeah. and they don't countenance nuclear power. Nuclear power is a great, clean form of energy. And, it's, and while we speak about energy, she will know that we have indeed listened. We have uh, implemented a, a limit uh, to energy prices. My uh, right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, who is no longer in her place, made uh, the, in the engagement within two days of uh, taking office, and it's something which I'm very proud of, and we've also extended it to supporting businesses. In fairness, the spokesman for the SNP was heard in silence by members on this side. I certainly expect the answer to be heard in silence, and especially as it affects the constituency's concern. Chancellor the Exchequer. And I was very surprised to hear her mention energy, given mm. the SNP's appalling record uh, in that regard. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very open. Uh, to her ideas, but I would very much recommend that she pursues nuclear power, which has got a great tradition in yeah, Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Byrne. Mr Speaker, I very much welcome the aspirations for growth, and all governments, all Conservative uh, chancellors, uh, should have their minds focused on sustainable growth. I welcome the measures on EIS and SEIS, which were planned I note the economic logic behind the banker's bonus cap change, but what I would say is that in my four and a half years as city minister, the biggest concern that banks had was for the overall tax burden, and I would urge him to keep a focus on the global competitiveness of that. But the final point I would like to make is in an era of grave uncertainty around inflation, there is a clear concern in the markets around the irreconcilable realities of monetary tightening at the same time as fiscal loosening. And I would welcome the Chancellor's observations and reassurance to the markets at this time. In terms, in terms, in terms of the two points he made, he's absolutely right to say bankers are concerned about the overall tax burden. And that's why. That's why many of the bankers in the City of London are going to Paris, because they're, being pay they're paying 30 per cent tax there. That's a legitimate thing, and that's why we've reduced, that's why we've reduced uh, tax uh, levels. 
With respect to monetary and fiscal policy, he will know that monetary policy is the responsibility of the bank and monetary policy is targeted on inflation and the fiscal policy that we've uh, fiscal course that we've charted has, 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 has absorbed two exogenous shocks in the form of COVID-19 and the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it is entirely appropriate in both those circumstances to have a looser fiscal policy to steer uh, our path through those shocks. There's entire logic uh, to those positions. Yeah, yeah. Dame Angela Riedel. <coughs> Chancellor, uh, without giving us uh, any sign of the figures, has um, had a budget now, uh, had, has announced what is in effect a budget with massive tax cuts, most of which go to um, those who are already well off. And he has asserted, Mr. Speaker, that this will lead to growth. But he must now admit that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that large tax cuts for the already well-off uh, actually lead to growth. In fact, the IMF has said the opposite. Yeah. 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 In, in response to that, I would say that there is plenty of evidence that high tax, high regulation socialism leads to a complete disaster where, as far as economic outcomes are concerned. And we are doing the opposite. Yeah. Andrew Lett, Dave Angela. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I commend my right honourable friend for the incredibly broad package of support for all those who are faced with massive energy bills right now? And does he share my concern that members opposite are talking down the size of that package, and that in itself is causing grave concern amongst pensioners and families who are not therefore understanding that actually help is on its way and that the government has sought to deal with that very grave concern. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend for pointing out that the scale of the intervention is unprecedented and millions and millions of people and businesses will be helped by what the government is doing. I'd like to thank her very much for that. John McDonnell. The cut of the 45p rate benefits the richest 1% in our society. Combined with lifting the cap on bonuses and his attack on those on universal credit, does he not realise that this is the most socially divisive budget in a generation? And has he not looked at history of engineered booms of this sort, which in the 1960s, the dash for growth created catastrophe in our economy, the barber boom of the 70s created unemployment, and the Lawson boom eventually created chaos. The only benefit which each of those three engineered booms resulted in the fall of, of a Tory government. Yeah. All I remember was the financial crash of 2008, which his own party presided over and, and managed, and managed uh, to engineer. The other point I would mention, the other point I would mention, is that the 40p rate was the rate for 20 years, and it was actually the rate that adopted by his party when they were successful and they used to win elections. John Redwood. I strongly welcome the growth plan and the tax cuts that will help deliver it. And, and does he agree with me that there are more obstacles to be swept aside so that we can grow more of our own food, produce more of our own energy, supply more of our own goods? to raise the living standards, generate the better jobs that we all want for our constituents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As so often, my right honourable friend is 100 per cent right. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah Olney. Very much, Mr Speaker. This Conservative government is completely out of touch. Yeah. Today we have witnessed the biggest and most irresponsible increase in borrowing in recent times, borrowing that could have been offset by increasing the windfall tax on oil and gas companies, but instead 
This bill will be paid by millions of householders yeah. through higher taxes for years to come. And the Chancellor's excuse for this reckless approach is that it will lead to growth, which will supposedly trickle down as higher prosperity for the rest of us. So will the Chancellor explain to my constituents how handing £45 billion of their taxes to the UK's most profitable companies and the wealthiest individuals will help them to get a GP appointment when they need it, give their children a better education and make their streets safer? Yeah, very good. So what the Honourable Lady... Uh, didn't mention in her question was the fact that a growing economy creates growing tax revenues which pay for public services. Her high tax approach, her high tax, high spend approach leads to a, a cycle of stagnation. We want to break free of that. Kevin Holland Ray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, growth and cutting of taxes are true Conservative principles. Yeah. So is balancing the books. By my calculations, the uh, deficit this year, based on his announcements, will be in the region of £250 billion. Pounds. Probably £150 billion. Pounds. That's certainly the evidence we got to the Treasury Select Committee yesterday. I'd be interested in his actual forecast, if that's not the case. But can he confirm, as he seeks to balance the books in the future, because of course there will be a higher deficit either way on this announcement, he will not do so by cutting investment in the North, infrastructure investment in the North, whatever the outcome may be in terms of his likely growth path from here. So um, my honourable friend will know that through growth, uh, we will get more tax uh, receipts, which will actually, uh, over the medium term, reduce uh, reduce certainly the net debt to GDP ratio, and that's 100% what we're focused on. And he's right that in the past we've uh, tended to reduce expenditure on capital projects, and we mustn't do that uh, in the future if we're to pursue our goals in terms of levelling up. Dame Margaret Hodge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we expect our government to implement policy based on evidence. And as a student of history, the Chancellor will be familiar with Anthony Barber's 1970 disastrous economic experiment. Same thing, low tax, deregulation, desperate quest for growth, and all that did was lead to the Barber boom, followed by a big crash, three-day working week, and it turned to bust. The Chancellor is risking all our livelihoods, yeah. Yeah. he's risking our economy, yeah. and he's risking our public finances yeah. on the altar of a discredited ideology. Yeah. 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 A tsunami of tax cuts and giveaways to 80,000 Conservative members who voted the, the uh, Prime Minister into office, and little for exactly. the 80% of Britons who are struggling yeah, yeah. and facing a tough, tough winter ahead is outrageous. Yeah. According to Einstein, Mr. Speaker, insanity is trying to do the yeah. same thing yes. over and over and expecting different <laughs> results. My question to the Chancellor is this. Can he not see that his budget is madness? Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's uh, perfectly sane to want to grow the British economy yeah. by creating incentives. And on the Barber boom, I mean, she's, an, she's a, uh, a student of history. The Barber boom was driven uh, very primarily by very, very loose monetary policy. Yeah. Uh, it was essentially a demand sort of pump priming experiment. This is the opposite of that. What we're trying to do is to create incentives and also look at supply side reform. Right. It's a completely different uh, model. Greg Hounds. I congratulate uh, the Chancellor on the measures announced today and congratulate him personally as well on his new role, uh, particularly the cut in base rate, the abolition of the 45p rate, the stamp duty cut, uh, and also the return of tax free shopping uh, to visitors, which will be very much welcomed in central London. Could I ask him to look further at the seven year bonus deferral rules in financial services, which are actually amongst the most punitive in the world today? Absolutely. We, I will be um, updating the House on our measures uh, for the financial services to try and make sure that they become, as they have been in the past, a world-leading industry. Sammy Wilson. Uh, I think many people will be astounded at the reaction there has been today at the Chancellor's proposal to increase economic growth in the United Kingdom, which will increase standard of living, increase employment, help to raise revenue for public services and reduce the national debt. I only hope that the Brexit freedoms that he's talking about 
Once we are free of the Northern Ireland Protocol, will lead to investment zones and regulatory reform in Northern Ireland. But would the Chancellor consider two things to help working families? First of all, as far as um, childcare tax-free allowances are concerned, which would be an immense help for uh, working families. Would he consider an increase in that? And since two-thirds of people in Northern Ireland rely on home heating oil, would he accept that £100 of an increase when there's been a 300 per cent increase in the price of heating oil is not acceptable? Uh, on, these, on those three issues, we're absolutely looking at the childcare issue, and I'm sure uh, colleagues, my cabinet, one of my cabinet colleagues will update the House on that. We're talking about uh, the heating oil uh, intervention. And on investment zones, we are very, very willing and eager to engage with Northern Ireland uh, colleagues and friends on working out how we can roll out investment zones uh, in Northern Ireland. Anthony Brown. Strongly welcome this uh, radical and generous package of measures to promote growth and provide support for households. And I also very much welcome the fact that we're positioning the Conservative Party as a low tax party. And I yeah. join my colleagues in welcoming the cuts to income tax and corporation tax and various other taxes. I also particularly welcome the cut to the most economically damaging of all taxes, which is stamp duty, which is yeah, seen yeah, as uh, yeah. reducing labour mobility, clogging up the housing market. That cut is welcome. But groups like the Institute of Fiscal Studies have called for the full abolition of stamp duty uh, to promote uh, economic growth. Will my friend, my honourable friend, the Chancellor, go even further and look at further cuts to stamp duty to reduce the economic damage it causes and the damage to households? My honourable friend, whose uh, policy prescriptions are always very interesting and, and, and very valuable. I've, I've only been in post two and a half weeks, so but I'll be very happy. I'd be very happy uh, to discuss with him how we can simplify. Uh, our tax system. Roshanara Ali. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that inflation is way off target, and today's announcement of 45 billion worth of tax cuts is going to make that worse, forcing the Bank of England to have to consistently continue to raise mortgage rates, and that's going to hammer homeowners and mortgage holders. The Chancellor hasn't published the OBR analysis. Isn't it time he does? And isn't the reason why he's not publishing it is because they reveal that he has broken the fiscal rules he voted for and will not achieve the growth target that he set himself? Yeah. Yeah. As I reminded uh, my right honourable friend, the OBR, and I said in my statement, the OBR will uh, be coming up with a forecast uh, certainly before uh, the end of the calendar year. Uh, and I'm very, very interested uh, uh, to, to hear uh, and to see what they, they have to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, President Putin has weaponised the cost of energy against Western economies, and the measures announced today are very welcome in helping our constituents uh, with temporary support through this uh, terrible uh, time uh, of invasion. Will the Chancellor confirm that the measures he's announced today that uh, support business will also continue to incentivise investment in renewable energy in this country so that we can never allow Putin to weaponise energy against us again? My, my honourable friend makes an excellent point with regard to renewables. Yes. Uh, it's always uh, salutary to remind the House we've got 11, nearly 12 gigawatts of installed capacity of offshore wind, which makes us the second. Uh, only to China in terms of the offshore wind rollout. And there's no reason why we can't continue to lead the world uh, in renewables, particularly in offshore wind, uh, solar, and other forms of renewable power. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Chancellor agree with the former Bank of England rate setter, Martin Wheel, who says that the government's approach could end in tears with a run on the pound? Yeah. What will end in tears is high taxes, high spend and very low growth. And that's what exactly the iron cycle that we're trying to break. Andrew Mitchell. I very much welcome what my right honourable friend has said uh, in, in respect of growth about investment zones, which uh, he says will come to the West Midlands. I think that will be very helpful in levelling up in the yeah. West Midlands and the Birmingham area. Um, can I remind him of the importance of the UK investment in tackling international problems, whether it's pandemics, illegal migration or climate change. That's about British expertise, but it's also about British money. Can he confirm to the House that we are on track to restore what was a manifesto promise uh, of bringing back the 0.7 in 2024? We're always uh, looking at our manifesto commitments, and given, and given, 
and given our, given our leadership in this, I hope that we can come uh, to the 0 0.7 as soon as is practicable uh, and, and the finances, the public finances allow. Ben Lake. The Chancellor began his statement by stating that the government will be cutting everyone's energy bill by an average of £1,400. But there are concerns, of course, whether this will indeed be the case for households and businesses that are not connected to the mains gas grid. Some 74% of properties in Ceredigion depend on alternate fuels that will not be subject to the measures announced this week. Therefore, will there be further support for such households and businesses to ensure that they benefit in a similar way to those that are connected to the mains gas grid? Yeah, we're discussing uh, support for off-grid uh, uh, properties, people who rely on heating oil and other uh, forms of uh, energy, uh, and that's something which my, honourable, my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, the Energy Secretary, uh, will be discussing as well, and will set forth in more detail uh, very soon. Sir so Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I welcome the short-term support on energy costs the Government is pursuing, and I welcome, too, the Government's focus on growth in the longer term. But would my right honourable friend agree that growth is dependent on confidence, confidence of businesses, but also confidence in households who spend on the products and services those businesses create? And would he also agree that that confidence will evaporate if people's costs on their mortgage increase further than the benefits that they gain from tax reductions. And will he do all he can to make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think my right honourable friend is, is right. But one of the two interventions we've made, I announced uh, today, uh, do have uh, an impact, a positive impact on inflation. The energy uh, intervention does that, and also reducing the tax burden. But he's quite right that there is a risk in respect of interest rates, and I'm speaking uh, to the Governor uh, regularly uh, to see what his views are on that. We're working closely together, and we will be, uh, we will be very focused on alleviating the burden on our constituents. George Howard. The Chancellor proclaimed the end of redistribution. Mm. Well, I listened very carefully, Mr Speaker, to the measures he announced, and it strikes me that they are redistributive measures. They re re redistribute away from those in the greatest need to those in the least need. How, Mr Speaker, does the, in that context, how does he defend spending £10 billion a year on the buy to let scheme, which serves only to um, help those who don't need it to buy houses that they don't live in and serves no purpose whatsoever for those who end up renting them. Just in the statement on helping people, there are measures in our statement across uh, the income scale uh, and we are very, very focused not uh, on, trying, on growth. So what I said was that we, we indulge in a fight on redistributing something which is small which we should be trying to grow, and that's where our focus is. James Carthledge. I congratulate my right friend on his statement and his position. Um, he knows that to increase output, he needs there to be capacity in the labour market, and that is extremely tight. He will come under huge pressure for loosening immigration rules. Can I urge him instead, as he said, to focus on the economically inactive, to ensure that they get the support? Because is it not the case that those who have been written off Yes, mild mental health, anxiety and all the rest of it. If they get the right support, it's in their interest to get back to work and it's in the interest of their self-esteem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My friend is absolutely right. There is a huge impetus, there's a huge pool of talent that needs to be brought into the labour market and every government, our government in particular, should be focused on trying to bring more people uh, into the labour market. Angus Brendan Mighthill. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor is... Um, midwife to profiteering by energy companies on the public's credit card. He's done very little, as my friend from Kerry Dignan said, about rural and island places uh, dependent on central heat and oil. People in my constituency in electricity are having a unit rate of 33 pence, while in London it's 29.6 pence, 10 per cent higher. The standing charge is 51 pence in my constituency, 32 per cent in London, a staggering 60 per cent higher. And these are figures from E.ON yesterday. This UK government is a highwayman absolutely stealing from energy-rich Scotland. Yeah. It is a disgrace. Yeah, yeah. And this Chancellor should be, should be conducting himself far more fairly than he is. This is, as has been said, something for the rich and not for the deserving. Yeah. Yeah. I reject that. And he will know that when I was Business, Energy and Industrial Secretary uh, 
uh, Industrial Strategy Secretary, I was very focused on bringing the uh, renewable uh, pot for remote island wind. And we, we achieved uh, great things working together, and I hope that we can continue that dialogue now I am in this office. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome our honourable friend to his place? And how refreshing to hear some Conservative policies. Yeah. 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 Weymouth, Weymouth is talking with officials about the idea of an investment zone. We are entirely supportive, and we very much hope we get it. But what they ask for, if we do get it, that we get the infrastructure funding to go with it, for without that, we will not attract the private investment that we need to create the prosperity and jobs. Okay. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. We're trying to link the investment zones, and we will link the investment zones to infrastructure projects because one without the other uh, is, doesn't, doesn't make sense. But I'd be very interested to talk to him about uh, Weymouth and about the opportunities for investment zones uh, in that area. In Meg Hillier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've seen this Chancellor rip up fiscal responsibility, sack uh, the senior civil servant at the Treasury, and mortgage our children's and our country's future. Yeah. And it's not just me that's concerned about his uh, ambition for growth. The Institute for Fiscal Studies yeah. tells us that we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge. I hope they don't know anyone does that. An increase in annual growth of more than 0.7% of national income the increase required just to stabilise debt as a share of GDP would be equivalent to the difference between the growth in the UK experienced in the 25 years from 1983. There is no miracle cure, they say. There is not. Can the Chancellor just admit that he's fiscally irresponsible and that he's gambling with this country's future? Yeah. I don't admit that at all. In fact, the gamble was to do nothing. The gamble yeah. was to stick on the, on the path that we were on and simply ra ra raise uh, spending and raise taxes and think somehow magically we were going to get to the promised land. That was not a credible path. This is. Nikki Aitkins. I certainly welcome the comprehensive growth plan that the Chancellor has outlined today. I particularly welcome the uh, reintroducing of tax-free shopping for international uh, visitors. I hope that also now includes EU citizens. This Chancellor, this government sounds like it's a very much a reforming government and I welcome that. Can you please, uh, my right, can my right honourable friend please guarantee that he will consider now reforming one of the most antiquated punitive taxes we have, business rates? Uh, uh, tax review to fit our tax system to the 21st century. And I'd like to pay tribute to my honourable friend and her campaign on VAT uh, duty-free shopping, because we engaged on that when I was uh, the business secretary, and I hope uh, that we can actually deliver on, on, her, on her vision. Kenny McCaskill. The world has seen this dogma over orthodoxy before in Pinochet's Chile adopting the Chicago Boys. That tanked the Chilean economy, and this will do the same to the UK economy. The pound will tank, inflation will rise, and in, uh, unemployment will escalate. Uh, social discord will also come as a result. The Chancellor says that tax is not simply about revenue, but about the economy. I agree. But it's also about the society that you want. Yep. And what he is doing is taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving to this generation and impoverishing the young and future generations. Ensuring that the UK becomes an ever more unequal society. That comes at a cost not just in unemployment, but all sorts of social issues that we saw in the 1980s. That's why Scotland demands its referendum. We want the opportunity to continue to build a better and fairer society. This is a route to disaster that will be paid not just by the poor, but indeed by middle income, and only the rich will benefit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad to hear the Honourable Gentleman's optimistic uh, assessment <laughs> of, my, of my growth plan. But I think he's entirely wrong. I think what we have to do is focus on growth. That's what we're doing, and that's what we will be delivering. Rick Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's uh, statement. He's absolutely right to focus the Treasury on growth. One of the most important sources of that is to build on our excellence in science and innovation. So, will my right honourable friend uh, say whether he's still committed to reaching the 2.4% international average? Uh, for R&D investment by 2027, uh, and to achieve his target uh, of 20 billion by the end of this Parliament. That, and I want to pay tribute to my uh, right honourable friend's uh, tenure in Bayes. Uh, he was a great uh, Secretary of State who really championed science. 
I uh, did uh, try to do the same in that post, and I look forward to engaging with him on the science agenda going forward. John Tricky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And isn't it clear that the Chancellor's growth plan only grows one part of the economy, and that's the bankers' bonuses and the incomes of the richest in our society? And if the Chancellor really wants to cut through the cycle of low pay, poor productivity and, and low economic growth, shouldn't he actually be abandoning his ideological commitment to trickle-down economics and finally announce a massive public programme of investment in England and Britain's regions and nations? So we, we do have a massive programme of investment, and it's called business and the private sector being able to mobilise capital to, to act in, in such institutions like investment zones. That's a really radical plan, and I was delighted to announce it this morning. Robert Halford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I strongly welcome the income tax cuts and the energy uh, rebates and the freeze, um, as well as the other cost of living measures, which will enormously help my constituents, many of whom are working seven days a week just to keep their heads above water. If I could just ask my right honourable friend, um, he knows that uh, petrol and diesel prices have been historic highs and that hauliers are pay have been paying up to £125 more every time they fill up, white van men and women filling up uh, £25 more every time they fill up uh, at the petrol stations. So will my right honourable friend, when he comes back and does a full budget, please do everything he can to cut uh, fuel duty, because as he's, he has made clear, he's a tax cutting Chancellor. Yeah, I'd be very happy Chancellor. to engage my right honourable friend on that. Uh, I've joined, uh, entered the House at the same time as he did, and I know that nobody has been more uh, tireless and unstinting in supporting uh, his constituents and lessening, focusing on lessening uh, the tax burden. Ali Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We welcome the Chancellor's targets to get back to levels of growth last sustained under a Labour government. Yeah, yeah. But under the Conservatives, the UK is currently forecast to have the slowest growth rate of any advanced economy next year. So can the Chancellor tell us what the OBR's estimate is of the impact of the measures announced today on growth? Yeah, as I said, the OBR will come up with a full forecast uh, before the end of the calendar year. Like Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend is well aware of the great opportunities in northern Lincolnshire and, and the Humber region, particularly surrounding renewable energy. And I welcome his announcement uh, relating to investment zones. And I and the two uh, Conservative local authorities in my constituency will want to work with him to deliver that. But even sooner, we can actually deliver on the Humber Freeports. Can he confirm that the Freeport uh, designation will continue and will he uh, unblock uh, the process that is delaying the uh, launch of the Freeport? The, the Freeports Just are certainly that. continuing and I'll be very happy to speak to my honourable friend about how we can, as he says, as he puts it, unblock uh, the process to accelerate uh, the Humber. Uh, Freeport bid. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This budget amounts to an environment reckless charter, and it is also a statement of missed opportunities. For example, a report just this week shows that a major programme of insulating homes in Britain and installing heat pumps could benefit the economy by £7 billion a year, create 140,000 jobs by 2030, get our fuel bills down, get climate emissions down too. Tucked away in the growth report on page 14, there is a tiny reference to some investment in energy efficiency. It is nowhere near enough. Why is he setting his face against the kind of retrofit revolution that offers the only viable way out of the current crisis, as well as reducing our dependence on fossil fuels? Is it because, for him, dogma and deregulation trump evidence and common sense every time? Uh, it's all about dogma and deregulation. In fact, in terms of the eco and energy efficiency measures, I have uh, campaigned for them certainly when I was business secretary, and I made sure that there was, in fact, reference uh, in the growth plan uh, to the eco uh, plan. And we're going to uh, try, and we may well uh, expand that at a, at, a, at a future date. Alberta Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nuclear power must form part of a diversified energy portfolio. Can I welcome? the measures that the Chancellor has announced today, particularly accelerating energy infrastructure. Can he just say a few words about whether his welcome package includes accelerating modular nuclear reactors? This is the future of the nuclear industry. Would you like to say a few words about that? Yeah, I, look, I was very focused, as he knows, uh, on SMR 
uh, production when I was uh, Bay's Secretary of State, and it's something that I want to, uh, the, the thinking about that, I want to bring into the heart uh, of the Treasury. There's still negotiations to be had, but he's absolutely right. SMRs, nuclear, that's part of our energy mix in the future. Jess Phillips. Speaker. Um, can the Chancellor just confirm for me that he has just announced a tax cut that means someone earning £1 million will be £40,000 better off? That is more than a nurse earns and over £10,000 more than the average wage in Birmingham. Yeah. What, I, what I am going to concern, uh, confirm is that the top rate of tax, the top rate of tax has gone back to what it was before she entered the House, but when the party opposite was successful and winning elections. The top rate was for 20 years, and that's what we've gone back to. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In the Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth area, there is already an enterprise zone which has been very successful, though the land allocated needs to be adjusted to take advantage of the opportunities in the offshore energy and a revived fishing industry. Can my right hon. Friend confirm that this existing enterprise zone will benefit from the opportunities that will be provided for the investment zones that he's announced? Chancellor. Uh, the enterprise zones, free ports, New investment zones will all benefit uh, from, uh, their, uh, the, from uh, tax reduction, planning, uh, relaxation, and of course, there will come a time when um, other zones, uh, other people, other places will want to become uh, investment zones. This is a huge opportunity uh, for communities up and down the country. Catherine McKinnell. Government and another growth plan. Yet the reality is the child poverty gap between the North East and the rest of the country is at a 20-year high. So can the Chancellor explain how giving these tax cuts to the most wealthy will put food on the table of children living below the poverty line in Newcastle this winter? When a recession uh, and economic downturns hit in the past, have hit in the past, the people most adversely affected are the most vulnerable in society. What that, that means that we have a duty to grow the economy and to make sure that we turbocharge growth. That's how we will help all of our constituents. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's statement and the return to low tax free market principles that we on this side know will lead to growth and prosperity for everybody in our country. Now, we know the role that the self-employed and entrepreneurs pay, played in growing the economy and getting us back to prosperity after the mess the party opposite made of the economy when they were last in government. So I was delighted to see the reforms to IR35 in my right hon. Friend's statement. Can he confirm that with 12,000 registered self-employed in my constituency, those reforms will come quickly to give the self-employed of today, the entrepreneurs of tomorrow and the businesses that might contract their services the confidence to get on and grow? Yeah. Yeah. Chancellor? Absolutely. 100 per cent. Mr Oswald. Mr Speaker, this statement seems completely divorced from the realities of most people's lives. The, the Chancellor has made the, the choice to deliberately remove the cap from bankers' bonuses while deliberately ignoring the needs of people who are already struggling to make ends meet. So what is his message to these people, the people who are not going to benefit from his loving with the, the super rich? How does he think people are going to manage? Does the Chancellor just not care? Yeah. 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 That's why we had the energy intervention that was announced uh, last week and that we put, we put forward it, uh, that we've uh, mentioned today. We've got uh, uh, eco uh, schemes, got the warm homes uh, discount. We've had a reduction of council uh, tax A to, to D. There's a huge amount of intervention that we've already done, and we will always protect the most vulnerable. Dan Poulter. Doc. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, my uh, right honourable friend has made clear his intention to lift the banker's bonus cap. But may I draw his attention to another uh, cap or threshold, the £40,000 uh, annual pension allowance, yeah. which is also causing uh, challenges, particularly to many experienced and senior public sector workers. Yeah. My honourable friend will be aware of the challenges, NHS workforce challenges that uh, our health service currently faces. Yeah. Uh, and unless the, this is, issue is dealt with effectively and we scrap the £40,000 annual allowance for defined benefit pension schemes, we are going to lose a lot of very experienced clinicians at a time when the NHS needs yeah. them the most. 
He can look at bankers' bonuses. Can he also look at this issue here? Well, yeah, the issue has been Chancellor. raised. And it's not just a question of the annual uh, limit. It's also the lifetime uh, allowance. I mean, anecdotally, I hear that is also a big driver. The, the, the fact that it's been reduced successively over time is a big driver of people leaving uh, the profession. And that's something I'd be very happy to have a discussion with him about uh, in the future. Mohammed Jassit. While millions struggle with the cost of living, the Chancellor's first priority is to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses and tighten the rules on benefits for those who have the least. Yes. The government has already forgotten that the bonus culture led to the banking crash. Yes. Lowering regulations put in place to, to protect ordinary people and their pension is dangerous. This is Tory austerity all over again, making the rich richer and the poorest poorer. At the time when key workers are being denied a decent pay rise, so why has the Chancellor chosen to help with the wealthy chums? Chancellor. The focus of the growth plan is on growth. It's on getting our economy moving and getting to 2.5 per cent. That's the lens through which I am uh, looking at this problem. And I'd be very, very uh, happy uh, also to remind him that we are protecting the most vulnerable. We are protecting the most vulnerable through the energy intervention and through other uh, forms of support. David Rutley. Mr Speaker, uh, growth sectors such as pharmaceuticals will no doubt welcome my right honourable friend's steps on corporation tax. Does he agree that supply-side reforms are also required, with the Department of Health and Bayes working with greater urgency to approve and adopt uh, clinically proven medical treatments to more fully realise the potential of the UK life sciences sector? Very pleased uh, to confirm to my honourable friend that is exactly what we need to be driving forward. We need to be quick, uh, uh, accelerating uh, process so that we can actually deliver outcomes more quickly. And I pay tribute also to the fact that he and I have been debating, talking about these issues for many years now. And I'm very, very pleased that he still remains as focused uh, on growth uh, as he did uh, you know, many years ago. Stephen Furry. Uh, thank you. It may be a very uncomfortable truth for some, but the biggest barrier to growth at present is the fact that there's increased barriers to trade with our dearest neighbour in the European Union as a result of, of Brexit. And of course, there is an alternative reality here today as well, which would be a windfall tax, increased windfall tax on energy companies, investment in a Green New Deal, investment in skills and sound public finances. And how on earth can we look our constituents in the eye when they have only been offered £100 for home heating oil, whenever potentially people are going to get thousands and extra benefits today, the wealth is in our society. Yeah. Yeah. We are looking at the heating oil issue. My right honourable friend, the Business and Energy Secretary, is looking at, at this, and we will come uh, to a decision uh, on Northern Ireland, I think, very imminent. George Freeman. Madam Speaker, could I thank the Chancellor for putting growth at the heart of his mission in the Treasury and yeah. for challenging Treasury orthodoxy and making that the priority, and in particular recognising the potential of Norfolk? Would he agree with me that there are different types of growth, and we need growth that drives levelling up, strengthens the union, that drives innovation for higher productivity? and that science, technology and innovation are fundamental to it. And would he agree with me, uh, echoing the comments of my right honourable friend, the Chair of the Science and Technology Select Committee, that we need the Treasury to move quickly to unlock private investment in fast-growing sectors? My honourable friend is absolutely right. I'd like to pay tribute to his uh, service as Science Minister when I was Secretary of State uh, in Bayes. We worked very closely together then, and I hope we can work closely now uh, to make sure that Treasury and other departments are as focused on the uh, science and technology agenda as my honourable friend. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Will the Chancellor give the important assurance that his predecessor gave that social security benefits will be fully uprated in the usual way in line with this month's inflation figure? <laughs> we will make announcements about that in due course. This is Helen Waitley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome my right honourable friend's focus and drive for increased economic growth and for making sure people get to keep more of what they earn? Can I ask him to assure me as part of that that government will be absolutely focused as well on reducing the barriers that sometimes prevent people from working more and earning more, particularly skills and childcare? I think the childcare issue has been raised many times and I'm looking forward to uh, more subsequent statements. Uh, from my uh, honourable, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education. That's clearly an issue which can unlock 
uh, uh, growth and also protect families uh, so that they can go out and earn uh, money to look after their, their family. I mean, that's really important. Tim Farron. Madam Deputy Speaker. Surely the Chancellor understands that the cut in stamp duty will do nothing to help 99% of people who can't quite afford their own home. It will do huge amounts to incentivise people who want second, third, fourth and fifth homes in my constituency, in Cumbria and other rural parts of Britain. Does he not realise the damage that excessive second home ownership and non-permanent occupied dwellings does to communities like mine, those in Cornwall, those in Northumberland and the rest of the country? Will he listen to rural Britain and stop backing second home owners and back our communities instead? Uh, we are backing uh, your, uh, forgive me, his uh, communities. We are backing communities We're, by reducing taxes, by creating the potential for investment zones, by the energy intervention, a whole host of measures that are backing ordinary, hard-working people. Sir Robert Neil. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome much of the announcement. Can I, in particular, welcome uh, the change to IR35? As the Chancellor will know, that has caused real distress and injustice uh, to many honest, hard-working, self-employed people. Uh, I also welcome the uh, changes to stamp duty, but will he bear in mind, as I'm sure he does as a Conservative, that we also believe in sound money and that we must keep an eye upon inflation, because we do not want the benefit of the stamp duty cut to be eroded for many homeowners by the increased mortgage costs? Absolutely, and, the, and he will understand. I mean, historically, if you look at uh, high bit periods of debt, we, 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 we manage to get out of that by growing our economy. That's why we've got a renewed focus on growth. What we can't do is simply tax our way uh, to prosperity. That has never happened before. Barry Shearman. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I inform the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer that that was probably the most disappointing yep. presentation I've had since my, I came into the House since 1979. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, what exactly is he hiding? Is he hiding the fact that what he's announced today will mean that in the future my children, our grandchildren, will have to pay the price of what he's announced today. Isn't that the truth? We're going to put this borrowing on future generations and that will blight the whole future of that generation. What I find extraordinary, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that people on the benches opposite stood on a, a platform of pure, unadulterated socialism in 2019, which was totally reckless, totally reckless, and had no interest in the private sector. What we're doing is putting more money into the pockets of people and businesses. That's what drives growth. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, is it not the case uh, that already the Chancellor's intervention to freeze energy bills is predicted to reduce inflation by five percentage points? And that for every single percentage point that inflation comes down by, it reduces our borrowing costs by £6 billion. And therefore, my simple economics, which the party opposite need a bit of a lesson in, is entirely feasible that within the G7 we have the second lowest amount of net debt to GDP. It makes this growth strategy entirely, entirely plausible. Uh, he's absolutely right. Because of careful stewardship of the fi public finances, we can, withstand, we can withstand the exogenous shocks represented by COVID-19 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've got the second lowest debt, net debt to GDP in the G7, and we will use uh, our position, our fiscal position, to help the most vulnerable in society. Yeah. Yeah. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Since the Chancellor came to his feet, the value of the UK government bonds has plummeted, yeah, which yeah, yeah, yeah. put the national debt yeah. into a serious crisis for generations to come. Yeah. How is he going to mitigate Check that? Check it yourself. Yeah. Check the, it. The, market, uh, the markets uh, uh, react as they will, but the, gro but the, growth, plan, the growth plan will uh, very soon show, show that we're on the right course and that we're steering us to a more prosperous future. Pat Warman. 
Well, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, I welcome the focus on putting rocket boosters under Britain's brilliant technology sector in the Chancellor's budget. But those internet businesses are open 24 7. This is a deregulating government. I wonder if the Chancellor would look at deregulating Sunday opening hours so that we can compete on the high street just as we can compete on the internet. So we, we, we've looked at this in the past. It was not without controversy, but I'd be very happy to hear his ideas uh, in this, on this subject. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor argues, on the one hand, that those on the lowest incomes, people on universal credit, should face the threat of their income being reduced further in order to boost economic growth. While, on the other hand, he says to people already on the highest income, bankers, that they need an increase in their income through their bonuses in order to do the same. Yeah. How on earth is that fair? Yeah. So, just a, a very basic lesson. We tax, we tax bonuses, we tax bonuses currently at about 50%, and that goes into public services. And it's absolutely legitimate to get more people into the labour market. That seems a reasonable thing to want to do. Virginia Crosby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As Chair of the Anglesey Freeport Bidding Consortium, I am delighted with the announcement of new investment zones by the UK Government. Can the <coughs> Chancellor say what this means for Honest Morn and its Freeport bid, especially with the deadline to submit by the 24th of November? Yeah. Morn has great, a fantastic uh, Member of Parliament and my honourable friend. And we are also not only focused on freeports, but on nuclear, the future of nuclear. And Innos Morn represents a hugely exciting opportunity uh, in that regard. Andrew Gwynn. So the Chancellor has admitted that the last 12 Tory years were a mistake. And for once I agree with him. But the real, the real impact of this budget is that we are piling on debt for future generations. Yeah. It's unaffordable. And if the Chancellor were a local councillor presenting this as a budget, his monitoring officer would be issuing him with a Section 114 notice, yeah. and his ministers would be calling in the commissioners. Yeah. 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 So the focus is on growth. As my honourable friend said, our net debt to GDP ratio is low compared to G7, and we are 100% focused on growing the economy so that future generations will be uh, able to deal with the, the, the fiscal shocks that they uh, have to deal with. That's what the purpose of this is. Sarah Brickler. Speaker, getting through key infrastructure projects and the announcement of investment zones, whilst helping families and businesses with their energy costs, is key for people in Haven and Haslingden. But Lancashire has been announced as an area that can be an investment zone, but there are significant differences and problems between West Lancashire and East Lancashire. So, could the Chancellor say whether it is possible for areas to have two investment zones in a county? Chancellor of the Exchequer. Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason why we can't have lots of different investment zones dotted around in lots of areas in the country. The, the deluxe sector is uh, conversing and engaging conversations as we speak uh, with various local authorities to see whether they can accommodate investment zones. Amy Callaghan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was not aware new legislation was introduced during a fiscal statement announcing a plan for this House to annihilate workers' rights yeah. during a statement framed at supporting our constituents and these very workers yeah, yeah. through the energy crisis is a new law even for a Tory government. I would say this government, but the, ch the faces change on these, these benches that often that I can't possibly, <laughs> possibly see this government. I would ask if he would scrap these plans, but these are not the plans of a Chancellor. The, isn't it the case that they are the ill-thought-out plans of a power-hungry Tory leadership candidate and they must be scrapped. Yeah, yeah. 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 We haven't, I didn't mention anything in my uh, uh, statement on workers' rights, and I've always been very focused on, 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 the bro on, broader, on broader workers' rights. And, uh, uh, and, and look, the right to strike, no, the, the, the minimum service levels are absolutely crucial to make sure that the public is protected from militant trade union action. It's entirely fair. It's what happens in Europe, and we are 100% committed to that. 
Anthony Higginbottom. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome the Secretary of State's focus on growth, which will allow businesses in Burnley and Paddington to grow and allow people to keep more of the money they earn. Following on from my honourable friend, the member for Hindburn, in East Lancashire, we stand ready to lead this country in aerospace, in cyber, in small modular reactors. So can I urge the Chancellor to look sympathetically on a bid from East Lancashire and would he meet with myself and other East Lancashire colleagues and the leader of Lancashire County Council to talk about what an East Lancashire investment zone might look like? So, uh, just to remind my honourable friend, uh, the investment zone conversations have been very much led by the DLUC uh, Secretary of State. I'm sure he will be engaging uh, with uh, uh, the, the relevant councils. And I'd be very happy also to talk uh, to my honourable friend about the opportunities that investment zones uh, represent. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I just take the Chancellor back to his party's manifesto commitment around levelling up? And what I want to know is, the investment zones, will they actually tackle the need for real infrastructure investment? So, for example, if he's really serious about growth, the need for the rail electrification line to Hull, which was ruled out in his party's integrated rail plan just last November for the next 30 years, Will he look at that again if he's yeah. serious about growth? Yeah. Yeah. We're always looking at infrastructure projects and measuring their uh, benefit cost uh, ratio. And of course, as far as investment zones are concerned, of course, they're naturally allied to key bits of infrastructure and they have to be coordinated. That's one of the purposes of, of what we're trying to announce. Mike Wood. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Investment zones have potential to make a massive contribution to levelling up for areas like Dudley South. But can the Chancellor reassure my constituents that the, uh, the more liberalised planning regulations won't mean the communities have to sacrifice the precious uh, green belt as the price for an enterprise zone? It's absolutely right. The, the, the whole premise and basis of the investment zone conversation is mutual consent. There has to be a mutual consent. They won't be imposed in any area. And absolutely, locals, uh, local uh, residents will have. Uh, and councils uh, will have a huge say in terms of how the investment zone develops. Jeremy Corbyn. Would the Chancellor Exchequer explain where is the morality in giving a huge increase in income to the very richest in our society and threatening the benefits of the very poorest in our society who are trying to get by on universal credit? What estimate has he got? of the levels of inequality that will exist in this country in one year's time and in five years' time as a result of his statement today. It is always our duty to help the most vulnerable in society. That's why we've had the energy uh, uh, intervention. That's why we had the COVID-19 pandemic uh, intervention. But also, it is, it is incumbent on the government uh, to try and seek to enable growth. And that's what we're focused on, too, uh, in this plan. Sean Bailey. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, uh, my, I welcome my right friend to his position, and you will know from his previous portfolio that high intensive energy industries have been acutely affected by the rising cost of energy prices. So I do welcome the government's intervention around energy prices. But what we need to see in the black country, particularly in our advanced manufacturing and metals industries, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this point was stressed yesterday to our right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, is to ensure that there is continued communication between the Treasury and obviously the Department for Business. So can my right honourable friend just reassure me that those discussions will be ongoing and he will assure that as circumstances perhaps change for high intense energy industries, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Treasury remains open to carry on that dialogue. Uh, he will appreciate that as uh, Bay's Secretary, I was very focused on energy intensive industries. I did engage uh, Treasury colleagues uh, then, and now I am in the Treasury. I'll be very happy to engage base uh, colleagues on this pressing issue. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It must surely be the definition of chutzpah to come to the House of Commons and complain about high taxation and low growth when you voted for 15 increase in taxation and you've been the business secretary who has taken the UK into recession. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It must surely be the definition of chutzpah to come to the House of Commons and say that you believe in sound money when you've just put £72.4 billion pounds on the Never Never um, credit card for the country. Let me just explain to him why people in the Ronda might think he's got this wrong. We don't have any bankers begging for additional uh, bonuses in the Ronda. We don't have anybody 
I would guess, earning more than £150,000 in the Ronda. But we do have a lot of families whose energy bills have doubled, even after what he's done, have doubled this year and will be going into energy poverty, who are seeing food prices going up by 15% and petrol prices locally going up even more. That's why we think he's a disgrace. Oh, no, we, need, we, need a, we need a question. If there was no question, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer can't answer it. I'm not sure there was a question. I'm not sure there was a question. Uh, we've, we've got to focus on growth, and through growth we get more tax revenue to pay for public services. That's a very fundamental uh, notion, and that's what we're focused on. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's focus on productivity. Will he also be using fiscal levers to tackle the productivity of housing stock in tourist locations like my North Devon constituency, which sees winter ghost villages as second homes and holiday lets sit empty, resulting in local businesses having to close and endless businesses unable to recruit their good jobs as there is nowhere to live? I'll, I'll absolutely be focused on that. I'd be very interested to hear more detail uh, with, uh, in a conversation with her to discuss what more we can do uh, to, to, to free up uh, the property market. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And with your forbearance, I'd like to pass on to the House the sad news of the passing of my predecessor, Jim Sheridan. He diligently served uh, the constituents of Paisley North and Rimshire West, then Paisley and Rimshire North for 14 years. And I'm sure uh, the House's thoughts are with his wife, Jean, and his family and friends. Uh, now, Madam Deputy Speaker, Jim and I didn't agree on everything. Uh, I think it's fair to say, but I'm certain that he and I would certainly agree wholeheartedly on the Chancellor's shameful and aggressive statement. Uh, workers' rights were important to Jim, as they are to me, so the further attack on those rights uh, announced today is to the Chancellor's shame. Uh, but he spoke of the riddle of growth, so I wonder if he could riddle me this. How is it that giving bankers yet more millions drives economic growth, but giving those on benefits a fair deal or those on low wages a cost of living pay increase drives inflation? Just before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to answer the question, um, may I, on behalf of the whole House, pass on to the family of Jim Sheridan, who was a much respected Member of Parliament here for a very important constituency, um, uh, the, the condolences of the whole House. Yeah. Chancellor of the Exchequer. I'll say very quickly that if bankers are working in London, they are taxed in London. If they move out of uh, the UK, they are taxed uh, elsewhere, and we do not see a penny of uh, tax revenue. The City of London, the financial service, is not just about the City of London, it is about Edinburgh, it is about a whole range of other countries, uh, or other uh, towns, uh, have to be at the top, uh, at, the, at, at, the, at the apex of the financial system, global financial system. We have got to attract the talent, exactly. and we can tax it, and that tax revenue is used to public services. Craig McKinley. Speaker, can I offer my um, well, absolute congratulations for the Chancellor's growth plan? And uh, he will know that my interest is in tax. The Register of Members' Interest will show that. And I'm delighted that we're seeing lower taxes and simpler taxes. And I think it would be fair to say that this party's you know, inheritance of saying we're a party of low taxes had become somewhat opaque and confused over recent years. I wondered if he would agree with my very simplistic summary of what he is saying today that this party believes in taking a smaller percentage out of a bigger pie rather than the state nicking more out of a static and diminishing pie, which seems to be the message of the party opposite, except for the DUP, of course. I mean, we, we, we openly repudiate a socialist vision of society. We don't believe that the state should take more and more of people's income. We think that people should keep more and more of their earnings. Nick Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor has sacked his Permanent Secretary, muzzled the Office for Budget Responsibility and is man-marking the Governor of the Bank of England. His freewheeling ideology is crushing dissent. So can I ask the Chancellor, will the Governor of the Bank of England still be in his job by Christmas? The Governor of the Bank of England is entirely independent, and I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman that we actually have struck uh, some very good relations. We speak regularly. I think that's a good thing. He might think that's man-marking. I think it's very cordial. Uh, and we're exchanging ideas. And that's what we uh, intend to do. Nick Fletcher. Yeah, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome my honourable friend into his place. 
After decades of neglect and, local and low aspiration under local opposition control, on behalf of the whole of Doncaster, I welcome this statement. If Peel Holdings today do the right thing, we will have saved our airport, and with low taxes at airports, an investment zone, and a grant from Bayes for the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, Aspiration Doncaster can be achieved and levelling up will be delivered, delivered, delivered. So will the Honourable Member please meet with me and look at all the opportunities that are available from this statement for the people of Doncaster? I would be very happy to meet with my Honourable Friend and discuss the opportunities represented by investment zones and other of our policies. Matt Rodder. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor has clearly put the interests of large energy firms ahead of those of families and small businesses. Isn't that why he's unwilling to publish the OBR's report? Chancellor. That isn't uh, true at all. We've actually intervened in a way that no government has done or, uh, to protect people from uh, gas price spikes. We've also um, focused on expanding supply. So I'd like to ask uh, members opposite their view on North Sea oil, North Sea gas. We're actually expanding. We're actually expanding that, and that's something that we're proud to do to expand capacity to reduce prices. Jane Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, yeah. Speaker. May yeah. I first of all congratulate my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, on an excellent speech and real focus on growth for this yeah. country. We are a nation of small businesses, both people who own those businesses and the employees uh, who work there. And this, you've really, really listened, I would say, Chancellor, uh, to those small businesses and understand the issues that they're facing. Um, given you've achieved all of this in only two and a half weeks, I'm wondering if you could. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the Chancellor could uh, could let us know the likely timescales and could they be just as quick on uh, the repeal of IR35 and business rates reviews. Thank you. I think we made announcements on IR35. Uh, I made an announcement this morning. I'd be very interested to hear her ideas on business rates because that's an ongoing conversation and I used to hear that the whole time when I was PPS to the Chancellor five years ago and also as Chancellor, as you say, as she says, for two and a half weeks. Wendy Chamberlain. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to know how this Conservative plan for growth is going to help unpaid carers, who Carers UK estimate deliver £500 million worth of care a day. While I have been speaking to constituents in North East Fife about my carers' leave bill, it's clear that carers' allowance prevents people from working. So, given that the Chancellor has failed to ensure or clarify whether we're going to see inflationary increases for benefits, will they at least look at ensuring that they don't impact with other benefits or at the very least allow people to work more before their carers' allowance is impacted? Yeah, we're, all, we're always looking Chancellor at ways in which we can encourage uh, people who are helping the most vulnerable in society do what is a critically important job. We're always looking at ways how we can improve that. Dr Ben Spencer. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. What's been announced today is more than just a fiscal event. It's a vote of confidence in Britain. A statement to the country that we can grow, we can aspire and we can achieve. Rather than wilt in the face of our challenges, we can and we will flourish. Does my right honourable friend agree? He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. We have a dynamic uh, population, high, highly skilled people, and our job in government is to empower people uh, to grow and to achieve and to thrive in the way he suggested. Neil Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Well, during the last 12 years of Tory government, public services have been cut to the bone and are now facing rampant inflation and escalation of costs. So, following his announcement, what reassurances can the Chancellor give that there will be no real terms cuts to the budgets of our public services? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to make any statements Chancellor. about uh, a budget here. Uh, t uh, this afternoon, this morning. Yes. Jerome Mayhew. Yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy yeah, yeah, Speaker, yeah. without <laughs> growth, government just becomes an exercise in rearranging <coughs> the deck chairs. So I absolutely welcome this unashamed focus on growth because, as the Honourable Member for Runnymede and Waverley said, it's a vote of confidence in the future of our country. Let's look at the Western Link Road in my constituency. 
Does my right hon. Friend agree that the decision to accelerate that project is exactly the kind of enabling infrastructure investment that helps local communities and unlocks local economic growth? My hon. Friend is absolutely right. By accelerating infrastructure projects, we can generate economic growth, we can generate uh, achievement, we can uh, sup- uh, infuse the supply chain and actually get Britain moving again. Marion Fellows. We want this country to be an entrepreneurial, share-owning democracy. I now want to extend an invitation to our recent, well, current Chancellor and uh, to come to Motherwell Town Centre and wish across and try and explain this pie-in-the-sky ideology to folk in my constituency who are scared to go to sleep at night in case they can't wake up and heat their houses the next day or feed their families. Where do you think this ideology is going to help those constituents of mine? It's not not ideology. It's a practical practical focus on growing the economy so we have a more prosperous country. That's what governments should be doing. And the uh, party opposite, the socialism that she, I don't know whether she represents that, isn't going to work. Simon Baines. Um, Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I congratulate my right honourable friend on his focus on growth in his statement? And would the government consider a cross border investment zone on the Welsh borders covering North East Wales, where my constituency of Clwyd South is located, and part of North West England, given the very close economic interrelationship between the two areas? Chancellor the Exchequer. Um, as I've said to uh, other colleagues, the uh, DLUC Secretary of State, my right honourable friend, is very much engaging with uh, local councils on where these investment zones can be located. But I'd be very happy to speak to my honourable friend about uh, looking at possibilities where we could uh, locate investment zones in the region he suggested. Matt Western. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, since uh, uh, people close to the Treasury uh, started trailing details about this mini budget over the last 10 days. Sterling has lost 5% in value against the dollar. Hasn't he just fired the starting gun on a run on the pound? I know it's fashionable for um, members opposite to talk down Britain and talk down. And they're, they're showing, they're showing, they're sh- I have to say, they show, they're showing an extraordinary interest. They're showing an extraordinary interest in the gyrations of markets. What, what will uh, improve uh, market sentiment is strong growth and, uh, and a Britain that's open for business. And that's exactly what we're trying uh, to achieve. Scott Bedd. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thousands of my constituents will welcome this statement, which will see the average working family in Blackpool over £1,500 per year better off through the combination of tax cuts and the energy price guarantee. They will also welcome the opportunities this could present for jobs and investment in the new enterprise and investment zones. How quickly can we roll one of these out in Blackpool? Yeah. Um, I would be very interested to have a conversation with him about this and also refer him uh, to my right honourable friend, the DLUC uh, Secretary of State. He is engaged with these conversations as we speak. Oh, Clive Betts. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So, after 12 years of failure, the answer apparently is to first of all blame workers and their trade unions, and then to blame the planning system, the system they've been responsible for for the last 12 years. Will the Chancellor explain, with regard to these new investment zones, which sound rather similar to the failed enterprise zones of the 1980s, what planning requirements are going to be abolished? Will that include the abolition of the requirement to build affordable homes for those that can't afford to buy? And has he done a detailed cost-benefit analysis of the proposals? Oh, if so, will he put that assessment in the library by the end of today? Uh, The investment zones, as I said, the core principle of them is consent. They won't be imposed on people. And actually, the enterprise zone, as I look at places like Canary Wharf, there were successes. There have been successes uh, of the enterprise zone, and I think the investment zones also uh, will be successful and look back uh, uh, fondly. Aaron Bell. 
Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I welcome my right honourable friend the Chancellor's statement? But more than that, could I welcome the clarity of his philosophy? We cannot tax our way to prosperity. Yeah. We, need, we need economic growth. And could I also welcome the principle that my Newcastle underlying constituents will get to keep more of their own hard earned money, both through the national insurance cancellation and through income tax? And could he set out how much better off a typical 30,000 a year earner will be because of the measures he set out today? Yeah. It will be hundreds of pounds uh, better off. Uh, the, the 1p rate is a £330 uh, benefit. Um, the energy intervention is roughly £1,200 uh, pounds per household. People uh, uh, all across our society will benefit from this approach that we're adopting. And as my honourable friend reminded the House, and the socialists never have understood, you cannot tax, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, you cannot tax your way to prosperity. Seymour Moral Hartrock. It's already clear that this desperate bid for an economic bounce after a decade of failure is not based on a plan for growth, but a wing and a prayer that if the rich get richer, then all will be well. It comes at the price of higher borrowing and inflationary pressures that will result in interest rates and mortgage rates going up. So as he brings in large tax cuts for the already well-off, what is his message? to his mortgage-paying constituents and mine, stuck on high interest rates, particularly those who are mortgage prisoners with SVRs they cannot change, who will be seeing their mortgage payments rise further and faster with his policies threatening the very home ownership he says he supports. So, um, the, the stamp duty mill band doubling is helping uh, people buy a home. The, uh, in, in her constituency and mine, there is an increase in the threshold uh, as around the country, but that will help lots of people buying a home. The energy intervention uh, will help her uh, constituents and, and my constituents, and the reduction in the basic rate will also help many of her constituents. Ben Bradley. Yeah. 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 The Chancellor announcing that he intends to let people keep more of their own money and choose for themselves how to spend it. How refreshing, yeah. Madam yeah. Deputy yeah. Speaker. I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. And I'm also pleased that Nottinghamshire has been able to be part of early conversations about investment zones. Now, the county is also on the final shortlist for step nuclear fusion investment. Imagine for a second, Madam Deputy Speaker, that huge infrastructure investment in the future of our domestic energy supply, supported by the incentives and the growth opportunity of an investment zone. We have some vision in Nottinghamshire, yes. Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it will require government departments to talk to each other. Can the Chancellor help? Absolutely. We fully intend, uh, while I'm in the Treasury, certainly to talk to departments to deliver the vision that I know he's driving in his constituency. Chiel Mora. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Newcastle paid a very heavy price for Conservative austerity mm. economics. Wages cut, public services slashed, growth stifled, businesses closed, good jobs lost. We were told there was no money to invest in no the North East regional economic growth. Now he is borrowing billions to gamble on tax cuts for the rich and boosting oil companies' profits. Still, working people are expected to foot the bill. So will he apologise to my constituents for making them poorer and expecting them to pay for it? So the, the, the tax cuts we've announced, I've announced, affect everybody uh, pay, who pays tax, and they will, and they, and they will affect, many, affect many, many people in her constituency. And I'm very, very pleased that through levelling up, we are now focused uh, particularly on driving growth right across our country, particularly with investment zones. I look forward to the investment zone. Yeah. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm sure many of my Edinburgh South West constituents will agree with me that threatening the low paid with sanctions while ensuring that bankers can get bigger bonuses is not a moral way to go about creating growth. Before the Chancellor says that Edinburgh will somehow benefit from this, can I assure him that most of my constituents that work in the financial sector will not benefit from these bonuses. Yeah, but yeah. Not content with doing that, he's also attacking the right of low paid people to strike to get yeah. better pay mm -hmm. and conditions. Now, the European Court of Human Rights has recently reaffirmed that under Article 11, the right to strike is a fundamental human right. So can the Chancellor answer me this question? Can he assure me that any legislation the government brings forward concerning strike rights will comply with the United Kingdom's treaty obligations under Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Yeah. The right to strike, there were two measures I referred to in this respect. The right to strike will not 
uh, be compromised by minimum service levels, nor is it compromised by requiring uh, union bosses to put a ballot to their entire membership ahead of a strike. These are not measures which uh, conflict or in any way uh, militate against the right to strike. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a budget and it should have been treated as such by the Chancellor. Mm, yeah. yes. It is the budget which is lining the Savile Row pockets yeah, of yeah. their friends and allies in the city and their funders in the city yeah. too. Who's paying for this? Is it the oil uh, companies making millions no. and billions? Is mm. it the mega corporations making millions and billions? No, it is working people. Will he admit it? Yeah, yeah. What I will admit, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the plan is a plan for growth that's going to drive entrepreneurialism and endeavour and uh, uh, economic opportunity in this country, and everybody will benefit from it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Whilst the Chancellor was speaking so optimistically about growth, the City saw the FTSE 100 fall, yeah. the S&P 500 fall, and the pound and, and the pound and the pound fall. The pound fall to the lowest level since, since 1985. <laughs> now he will appreciate that, given that oil and gas prices on the wholesale markets are in dollars. That has just increased still further the borrowing that he will have to pay for the package announced yesterday. Yeah. But if he is so optimistic about growth, will he set a time scale? Will that time scale be six months? Will he retire in a year if the growth that he has predicated hasn't been achieved? Or is this an admission that he's going to stuff as much money into as many of his friends' pockets yeah. before the general election yeah. in 2024? Yeah. 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 He, he, he will also know that over the last two or three months, oil and gas prices have come off uh, quite a bit. So actually, the long-term contracts we're negotiating are just as likely to be uh, much less costly uh, than increasing costs. And of course, in terms of our growth plan, I'm not embarrassed about wanting to grow the uh, British economy. I'm not embarrassed about driving opportunity in this country, and I don't believe that higher taxes lead to prosperity. Helen Hicks. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. For the first time ever this year, the number of women aged 25 to 34 leaving the workforce to care for children is going up. Four in ten mothers have considered giving up work or cutting their hours because of the cost of childcare. More than a third of parents of primary age children are in part time work. Why does the Chancellor think that bearing down with punitive sanctions on the lowest paid working parents who work part time will help them increase their hours when what they really need is an accessible, affordable childcare system fit for the 21st century? I think she's absolutely right to identify childcare as a crucial issue. And that's something which I'm looking forward to my uh, uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, to update the House uh, in the next few weeks. Ian Lavery. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Within seconds of the Chancellor's uh, financial statement, he declared war on the trade unions. He declared war on those less well off in society, those on universal credit, at the same time um, scrapped but they, the cap on bank bonuses. That's ideology. That's ideology unfettered. Can the Secretary of State say who will benefit most from the huge financial intervention that day? Will it be someone on a salary similar to the right honourable, honourable gentleman or someone like in my constituency, a, a two a uh, two-parent family with two kids who are having to use or having to claim universal credit to top up their income. So uh, the energy intervention will help all his constituents deal with higher energy costs this winter, and the uh, reduction in the basic rate, which we've pulled forward one year, will also help people to the tune of £330 a year. That's a broad swath of our countrymen and women. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. One group who never get a mention in fiscal events from this government are millions of unpaid family carers. Yeah. There's no increase here for their miserly £67 a week carers allowance. If they work part-time, as we've already heard from other colleagues, this government is threatening them with sanctions if they don't increase the hours they work. Cost of living help? 
only £150 to help disabled people and their carers. That won't even scratch the surface. So I asked the Chancellor what his plan with tax cuts for the highest earners says to those who do that vital work of caring for vulnerable and disabled people. He told the Honourable Member for North East Fife earlier that he wants to take opportunities to help them. He hasn't taken an opportunity to help them. Yeah. Yeah. We have. I mean, two uh, measures. We've reversed the national insurance increase, which uh, cut, was a tax cut for 28 million people, worth £300 a year. We've also brought forward uh, the, one, the reduction, uh, 1p reduction in the basic rate to 19p, which is also helping people to the tune of £330 a year. That's help to lots and lots of our constituents. Chris Law. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm actually quite astonished because I don't think I've received a single letter from any constituents that are saying, from a fat cat or any geologist or of the richest 1%, please help us with the cost of living. <laughs> However, what I have had is a bag full of constituents write to me about the cost of living and what help there would be in this package. Those of which, the most vulnerable in our society, the disabled. It seems that given where we're at just now, disabled are having to choose heat over eat, they're losing out in therapies, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society next week will be publishing a report which will show that 40% are going into a real deep crisis this winter and not a single package has been announced. So can I ask the Chancellor of Exchequer, what package are you going to put forward for the dis disabled people in our society that we all care for, yet not a single word is in this budget? We do uh, care for the most vulnerable in our society. That's a, a duty of government, that's a moral duty. Uh, of government, and we have uh, me announced measures in the energy space, which is helping a whole range of people, whole range of people, which is fundamental to the cost of living in terms of tackling bills this winter. Toby Perkins. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. The pound has reached its lowest rate uh, against the dollar in the time that the Chancellor has been on his feet. The FTSE 100 index is down 1.7%. Uh, simply today. Now, when my honourable friend from York Central <coughs> raised it to him, he said, well, the markets will react as they will. But if the point of his plan for growth is to increase confidence, and even the city believes stuffing the pockets of the very wealthiest and expecting bankers' bonuses and uh, oil company profits to lead the rest of us to prosperity is a bad idea, who is actually on his side? The growth plan is about growing the economy, and we're not going to grow the economy by increasing taxes indefinitely. Mike King. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The uh, Chancellor <laughs> mentioned that, that it would cost £60 billion for his energy package for just six months, but the Prime Minister promised that that package would go on until 2024. £240 billion pound borrowing requirement to fix a broken energy market today, saddled on future generations. Can I ask the Chancellor, does he think that's a price well worth paying? So I think he's got the mathematics slightly wrong. The, the, the business support is six months and the household support is for two years. Uh, so those are two things that need to be disaggregated. And of course, in terms of long-term pricing, nobody in this room, nobody in the world has any idea what the forward uh, uh, price will be or what the price will be in two years. So it would be uh, misleading to put a price on that. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Not just the American president, but the dogs in the street know that trickle-down <laughs> economics doesn't work. Here, here, here. What this statement does is push money into the pockets of bankers in the City of London and big fossil fuel companies. Mm -hmm. It will kill high streets. Mm -hmm. It will take money away from local economies. And to depend the entire UK economy on one big city while strangling everywhere else yep. is the opposite of levelling up. Here, here. This document claims on page 32 that the price cap of 2,500 will bring down the average household <laughs> bill to two and a half thousand. That's still 600 pounds yeah, more yes. than yep. it is now, and double what it was in January. Yep. So, what will yep. the Chancellor do to help people right now, and will he particularly cut VAT on fuel as Germany has done? Yeah. The, the investment zones uh, and uh, our ability to uh, motivate, incentivise uh, investment is going to help uh, a whole swath of communities across the UK. The reversal of the national insurance tax and the uh, bringing forward of the 1p reduction also will help 
uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions, of our constituents. Dan Carter. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The UK is already a deregulated, low-tax economy with, with the most draconian workers' <laughs> rights in the whole of Europe, in which the richest are well rewarded. It would be bizarre if it wasn't after 12 years of a Tory government. But what that has not led to is the transformation of skills and training across the workforce. It's not led to rising wages, which are still less in real terms than they were before 2010. It has not lifted children out of poverty, and it's left us ranking 150th in the world for the investment that the Tories always talk about it. Can, can I ask the Chancellor a very specific question? Will he accept this fact? There is no correlation whatsoever between tax burdens and prosperity across high-income countries. Yeah. I don't accept his proposition that the level of tax is immaterial. I don't accept that. I don't believe that we can just tax our way to prosperity in, in the way that the socialists uh, claim. And I, I absolutely reject the idea that tax uh, doesn't incentivise economic activity. Uh, Paul Blomfield. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. After 12 years of Conservative economic failure, the Financial Times reported earlier this week that those on the lowest incomes in the UK are much poorer than their counterparts across the rest of Europe, 20 per cent below Slovenia, for example, while those at the top are among the wealthiest. Now, the Prime Minister has said she doesn't believe in redistribution. The measures announced today suggest she does but in the wrong direction, yeah, yeah. taking from those who have least and giving to yeah. those who have most. Yeah, yeah. Does he not recognise that the British people will see it exactly for what it is? Yeah. What I do recognise is that socialism and high tax doesn't work. And he and others have stood four times on a socialist platform. The British people have rejected them four times. And if they go back to the socialism, they will be rejected once again. Today we have heard the promise of accelerating energy infrastructure. Since I have been in this place, every MP in South Wales has been asking and demanding for a tidal lagoon in Swansea Bay. Now, will the Chancellor make that commitment to work with Welsh Government and Swansea Council to make tidal energy, green energy, in this country a reality? So I've done uh, my, uh, a lot in that regard, actually. I, we had a, we had a, a, ring, te a ring fence. Uh, for tidal marine uh, energy, and there is a project in Scotland which is focused on that. The, the, the lagoon uh, project she mentions, I uh, looked at and wasn't uh, at the time value for money. But I'm open. I'm open to the concept. Patricia Gibson. Madam Deputy, mean that in Tory Britain, someone earning fifty thousand pounds will pay the same income tax rate as a millionaire. Today's plans mean someone earning a million pounds a year will pay £42,500 less income tax every year, and that is shameful. These plans were not in the Tory manifesto, uh, they don't have a mandate, and they certainly don't have a mandate in Scotland. The UK is already the most unequal country in Europe in terms of disposable income, according to the OECD. And after today, that inequality is guaranteed to widen. He may be proud of his announcements today, but what does he say to those who will now conclude that, just like Britain, the Chancellor's moral compass is broken? I reject uh, that implication. I reject that statement. We are absolutely focused in the Treasury and across government on helping uh, the most vulnerable, and that is why we had the most radical energy intervention that any British government has ever made. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The reality is this is a class war budget. This is an ideological budget. This is about taking from the poor and giving to the rich. It's about lining the pockets. It is about them and us. And that party over there have said 
We do not care about ordinary people in this country. We care about piling on debts. We will make ordinary people pay while our chums in the city get rich. And will those chums spend the money on the economy? No. They will squirrel it away to tax havens around the world. That's what they have always done. Is this budget not a disgrace? So what I want to reiterate is the fact that reversing the national insurance increase, which Labour supported, Labour supported, Labour supported, four, three months ago, Labour supported or voted against the increase in the national increase. I've reversed this. We've reversed this. That helps people. That helps people. Bringing forward, bringing forward the basic, the, 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 the one p uh, uh, cut in the basic rate helps people. That's not class war, Madam Deputy Speaker. Clive Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The portion of income for the wealthiest over the last 12 years has actually gone up. So how come his economic miracle hasn't been working for the last 12 years? And where does his mandate come for this new era? Because it's worth reminding ourselves that two-thirds of the members on the benches opposite didn't vote for a, a candidate that supports the economic approach that the Chancellor has taken today, and only 43 per cent of Tory members voted against it. So the choice today is clear. Who pays the bill? Is it the taxpayers or is it these high earning energy companies who have got excess profits? The choice is clear for the public, so why don't we put it to a general election? Because he doesn't have a mandate for what he's doing today. So the, the choice is clear as to whether we should back uh, growth driven by the private sector or we believe that the state can tax its way to prosperity. That's a very easy choice to make, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's clear that taxing uh, and, and spending to prosperity is a failure. Laura Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The people of Putney, Roehampton and Southfields will see right through this budget for how little it will do for them. The only growth this growth plan will deliver is a growth in inequality. Does the Chancellor agree with his department, who, according to reports, have carried out analysis that forecasts that the UK oil and gas producers and electricity generators will receive as much as £170 billion in excess profits over the next two years. Shouldn't they pay their fair share? Yeah. That, that figure is not relating to um, taxable profits here in the UK, and it's not uh, remotely accurate. Deidre Brock. Uh, how and when will the Chancellor address the concerns raised by economists at the Resolution Foundation, the Institute for Government and the IFS that this package doesn't meet current fiscal rules? Um, as I said in my statement, we have a medium-term fiscal plan which will outline the medium-term approach to fiscal discipline uh, in, in the next few months. Zara Sultana. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My constituents are terrified at rising bills. That's the word that they use, terror. Energy bills are still going to be double what they were earlier this year. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a crisis for the working class, but it's not a crisis for the Chancellor's class. Already making record profits, this is a banker's budget. It scraps the cap on bonuses, it slashes tax on the top 1% of earners and cuts tax on the profits of big business. Up and down the country, people are saying enough is enough. On their behalf, can the Chancellor tell me, does he really believe helping bankers and millionaire CEOs who need, who needs the most help rather than working class people? Well, two things. The reversal of the national insurance uh, increase puts £330 a year on average to 28 million people and bringing forward uh, the uh, basic rate, the cut in the basic rate by 1p, uh, actually puts £330 uh, into uh, the average uh, person's pocket. That is not uh, a banker's bu a bu a budget. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Madam yeah. <laughs> We've had a lot of words, but my constituents care about the numbers, and they will think that £18 billion is an awful lot of money. So what, Madam Deputy Speaker, are they going to get for it? The Chancellor stated in his statement that that would pay for business investment, job creation and would raise wages. So I want to know precisely by how much real wages will rise by the end of this forecast period. 
We don't, we don't yeah, no. run. This is not. This is not the Goss plan. This is not the Soviet Union. I can't predict. I can't predict what the average wage will be. But I do know that one way to destroy the economic productivity of this country is to is to, if she will f- permit me, uh, is to uh, raise uh, taxes in the way that she's campaigned for over many many years in her Corbynista days, whatever uh, that she was representing. That is not the way to to grow e- e- the economy in this country. Richard Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Please may I remind the Chancellor that uh, security is the first responsibility of government. Um, uh, Please may I ask the Chancellor how today's changes in corporation tax might serve to reverse the cuts to the army of 10,000 soldiers, which will make the army the smallest that it has been since the Crimean War. So the corporation tax hasn't been changed, it's just been kept uh, at the level that, it's, that, that it is now, so there's no change in that. And in terms of defence spending, he will know that my right honourable friend has committed to a 3% of GDP defence target uh, by 2030, recognising the changing nature of the threats uh, and the real importance of our armed forces. Imran Hussain. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor this morning uh, promised new laws Uh, to speed up the building of uh, uh, major infrastructure projects. So can I take from him this, that he's actually fully behind the Prime Minister and her promise to build the biggest infrastructure project in my constituency, the Northern Powerhouse Rail. And can I expect to meet with him soon after conference recess to immediately discuss plans to build it in full, including the Bradford stop. I'll be very happy to meet uh, the Honourable Gentleman to discuss infrastructure projects. We published a list of things that we want to accelerate, but infrastructure projects clearly are critically important to the growth plan, so I'd be very happy to meet him uh, at a time which is convenient. Patrick Brady. You, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I just be clear with the House that the 2,500 figure for energy bills is for the typical or average household, and in fact many non-typical and non-average households will continue to pay more, and they will often be people with the greatest needs and in the greatest needs, and they will continue to pay more until there are structural changes to the energy market, including sorting out prepayment meters, yeah. sorting out the standing charge, yeah. and ending the link between gas and oil prices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he's absolutely right to say that. In terms of the energy market, we do need to look at how it works. It, it's, it's, it's openly discussed the fact that the, the gas price actually determines the electricity price, where actually a lot of our electricity generation is non fossil fuel based. It's, it's, it's based on renewables. And that's work uh, that I commissioned in Bayes that I hope to see uh, completed very soon. Chris Stevens. Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what message does the Chancellor have for working people today? We are having to utilise food banks, now considering utilising warm banks, and at Christmas time we will have to utilise toy banks, whilst at the same time his government plans to introduce legislation to drag out pay negotiations, which will drag on for months, leading to the stagnation of wages. Is not the SUUC correct when you describe his statement as a full frontal assault on working people in Scotland? It's nothing of the kind. What people will benefit from is a reversal of the national insurance uh, increase, the acceleration, the bringing forward of the 1p cuts in the basic rate. That's what uh, millions, tens of millions of people in this country will benefit from. Sarah Jones. Deputy Speaker, a young adult asked me yesterday whether I really believe that things in our country could get better, which is in direct um, the direct opposite of my young adulthood, where it didn't occur to us that things would get worse. What is it about 12 years of Conservative government that have caused such poverty of hope? And what is it about this tired set of ideas that have sent the markets crashing that is going to work when all the other ones have failed? Um, We're focused on growth, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's through growth that the young person that she spoke to is going to get more opportunities and more benefits and actually have a much better funded public uh, sector. Richard Berger. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Tax cuts for the richest, bigger bonuses for bankers. This is the classic, classic trickle-down con trick. 
The wealth won't trickle down. In fact, it will be sucked up into fewer and fewer hands. So won't the Chancellor admit that that is what this is designed to do? That the Tories are acting like Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor and giving to the rich? Yeah. And isn't that appalling at this time when people across the country, people out there, are really suffering during this cost of living emergency? So there are three big measures which are helping people up and down, millions, tens of millions. Firstly, the energy intervention announced by my right honourable friend uh, last week, uh, the reversal of the national insurance uh, planned increase, and of course the acceleration, the bringing forward of the 1p cuts in, ba uh, in the basic rate. He should be welcoming those measures uh, and not playing to the gallery with his tired old uh, socialist yeah. rhetoric. Yeah. 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 Vera Hobhouse. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Oh. Access to dentists has reached a catastrophic low. One in five people are resorting to DIY dentistry with shocking stories from many of my Bath constituents. The only way to get a dentist appointment now is going private, which costs far more than any tax cuts will offset. How will the tax cuts today offer my Bath constituents proper access to the dental care they need? Well, well, what um, the growth plan will do is mean that as we grow our economy, we can get more tax revenue to pay for vital public services. That's a key part uh, and a key rationale of the plan. Okay. Margaret Ferrier. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the Chancellor on his appointment. Family-owned Equis ice cream in my constituency has been struggling with soaring energy bills. This century-old company will miss out on the government's support because their energy contract was renewed one day before the arbitrary cut-off following the collapse of their supplier. Can I ask the Chancellor and his colleagues to review this cut-off date to support small businesses? Obviously, I'd have Chancellor. to look at the specifics of the case, and I've just heard it uh, today. But if she um, corresponds with my department, we can, I'm sure, get back uh, with a timely answer to that question. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is not a growth plan for the constituents in my Liverpool Riverside constituency or the four million children living in poverty. The No Child Left Behind campaign is calling urgently on this government to tackle child poverty. So can the Chancellor commit to finding funding to roll out free universal school meals immediately and tackle childhood poverty? Uh, this is not a spending statement, but of course we take child poverty, uh, the vulnerable, extremely seriously, and that's why that was the basis of the energy of the energy intervention. Ruth Cadbury. Madam Deputy Speaker, firstly, could I thank the Chancellor for overturning his business secretary's statement yesterday on onshore wind by removing the ridiculous planning uh, restrictions that are unique to that sector? Talk about a one day cabinet flip flop. But secondly, can I warn him against removing normal planning rules on development and investment zones? When the Tory government removed the need for offices to housing uh, planning rules, uh, those conversions led to housing which were tiny rabbit hutches, no natural light, no basic services, and often away when they're on industrial estates, away from basic things like footpaths, bus stops, schools, and parks. Is this a dodgy developer's charter too? Not at all. The whole purpose, the whole principle behind the investment zone is a mutual consent. No investment zones will be imposed in any areas, and it will be very much up to uh, local councils to work out uh, which are appropriate sites for the investment zones. It's a cooperative exercise which will not be uh, the developer's charter that she describes. Christian Wakefield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we were promised a big bang by the Chancellor. Instead, we've barely got snap, crackle and pop. Madam Deputy Speaker, we've got tax breaks for rich whilst he tells the next generation to pay off a debt that he is piling up. Truly the Chancellor of sound money. The Resolu Resolution Foundation said that the poorest 10% of households will gain all of £11 from his budget. That isn't a budget, of course. He is also raising the cap on bankers' bonuses while threatening to cut benefits for 120,000 people on universal credit. Why is he not looking out for those who are struggling the most and instead acting as the Chancellor for fracking donors and bankers? Yeah. Well, it's nice to see him in his uh, place on the other side. Um, uh, 
in splendid isolation there. <laughs> but, but I would remind him that the measures relating to national insurance and the basic rate do actually uh, help uh, the vast number of, a vast number of uh, constituents uh, on both sides of the House. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I wonder, what does it say about the government that at the height of a cost of living crisis, we appear to have a Chancellor who is putting pressure on the Governor of the Bank of England to increase interest rates, presumably on the basis that he considers that there's too many people right now who have got too much money in their pockets? And what also does it say about the priorities of the government, I wonder? Of all the groups that the government has rushed furthest to help, it's bankers suffering the indignity and privations of only being able to qualify for bonuses double their salary. We have an economic historian for a Chancellor. Isn't the legacy of today's statement going to be that for tens of millions of households of the length and breadth of the UK, he's going to make any notion of a fair economy history? Any cursory look at the history of this country shows that the way to deal with uh, debt, the way to deal uh, with um, cost of living issues is to grow the economy. and That's why we're 100 per cent focused uh, on that. Beth Winter. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As the TUC has pointed out, the Chancellor has said that we have been far too focused on redistribution and not on growth. But here he has been this morning making announcement after announcement that redistributes to the wealthy, lying in the pockets of the bankers and the fossil fuel companies. Yeah. People in my constituency of the Cunningham Valley, indeed millions of people up and down the country in receipt of public um, pay, in receipt of social security benefits and pensions, have never benefited from any form of redistribution under this Tory government. All they've experienced is pay freeze, benefits cap and a freeze on the, um, the triple lock. Isn't it the case, as the overwhelming evidence does show, that the only thing that is growing is people's, um, people's debt, people's energy bills, and um, sorry? Oh, keep going, keep going. Order, 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 order. I think the Honourable Lady's probably got the message that she's taking too long, but I can't blame only the Honourable Lady because lots of people have taken too long. I've been quite lenient because we've got plenty of time today, but you know there's still a question of courtesy to the House. I hope the Honourable Lady will just put her question now, please. Absolutely nothing for the majority of people in this country being plunged into poverty, increased inequality. You have failed this country. You're neoliberal economic. Order! Order! Well, I politely asked the Honourable Lady to just put her question, can't she just put her question? Has she put it? Because I didn't hear it. Okay. It wasn't clear what the question uh, was, but if she's suggesting that we haven't helped people with this growth plan, I would just uh, gently remind her that the energy intervention helps nearly everybody. The reversal of the national insurance increase helps 28 million people and gives them £330 a year. And the accelerating the cut, uh, the 1p cut in the basic rate, also gives uh, £300 a year uh, to the average worker. These are substantial benefits, which I'm sure our constituents will appreciate. Helen Morgan. Mm. Thank you, Madam. De Deputy Speaker. I think today's statement has shown that the Conservative government is out of touch with rural Britain. The Rural Services Network have said that people in rural areas face significantly higher costs, partly due to being reliant on private transport and partly, as we discussed in the House, on uh, off-grid heating, and that they earn much less than their urban counterparts. So can the Chancellor explain to me how today's budget will help people living in rural areas? I think she does well to raise this issue, because clearly uh, people uh, affected uh, who, who, who benefit from a limit to the price of electricity Aren't cover, don't cover uh, people in rural areas who are off the grid, and that's why uh, my right honourable friend, the business secretary, has announced uh, some measure of support. And there are, we're also looking at other ways uh, that we can we can help uh, people in, in the way uh, that she's described. Peter Grant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm very proud of the fact that Glengorthis was the first town in any of our four nations to be recognised by the Living Wage Foundation for yeah, its yeah. progress towards becoming a living wage town. That's a proper living wage, not the Chancellor's pretending kiddie on one. The Living Wage Foundation have recently confirmed 
that the proper living wage needs to increase by over 10% just for people to stand still. Now I know that Fife Council, other public bodies and the many private businesses that act as their suppliers are very keen to continue to pay that fair living wage to all of their workers. So will the Chancellor confirm today that the budget, the public spending budget, will guarantee adequate funding so that responsible public sector employers can continue to play, mm. pay a fair wage to essential workers? Or does he expect key workers to survive on rounds of applause for another 12 months? Yeah. We've made uh, lots of progress in terms of the fair wage. Also, I might now add that the uh, mi uh, national uh, minimum wage is something that we've uh, increased and we've always uh, sought to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Kirsty Black. The Chancellor seems to believe that there are two fundamentally different groups of people in these islands, two classes, if you will. Why does he believe? that those earning megabucks will be incentivised by increasing their already excessive wealth, while those who've had to skip meals during the course of the summer in order to survive will be incentivised by having that paltry amount reduced even further. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a complete misrepresentation or willful misunderstanding of our position. What we've done in the Growth Plan is protect uh, millions and millions of vulnerable people. We've allowed them to keep more of their own money. I know she's not necessarily in favour of that. And we want to drive growth and entrepreneurialism in our uh, economy. And finally, the prize for perseverance and patience goes to Ian Byrne. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We have a budget for the 1% by a grim, bankrupt and Thatcherite Tribute Act. One in three in my great city are in food poverty now. I have constituents unable to put the heating on, take a hot shower, put a meal on the table, at the current levels, which was mentioned before, a double from January. This does absolutely nothing for them. So will the Chancellor actually focus on the people who are facing this humanitarian disaster across all our communities, instead of playing to the rich bankers who, bank who bankroll this party? And will he sit down and meet with me and discuss how a right to food would yeah, right yeah. some of these wrongs in society. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Chancellor of the Exchequer. I'm always, uh, as a minister, I've always been open to colleagues uh, on both sides of the houses. People have uh, spoken to me. I sometimes, regrettably, have uh, some of my conversations leaked to the press. Um, but I'd be happy to speak to him on an issue of concern to his constituents. Thank you. In a moment, I will call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move the provisional collection of taxes motion. Copies of the motion are available in the vote office. In accordance with standing order number 51-2 on Ways and Means motions, a Minister of the Crown may, without notice, make a motion for giving provisional statutory effect to any proposals in pursuance of section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968. And the question on such a motion shall be put forthwith. I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move the provisional collection of taxes motion formally. Move formally. The question is the motion on stamp duty land tax reduction as set out in the provisional collection of taxes motion. As mayors of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. That concludes proceedings on the Chancellor's statement. Thank you. Well done. Well done. I now call Kate Niveton with her petition. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to present a petition recognising Burton's brewing industry is of national cultural importance and that the recent decision of Molson Coors to move their head offices to the National Brewery Centre puts Burton's heritage items at risk. This issue has rightly gathered national attention, with recent online campaigning gaining thousands of supporters and national news coverage highlighting the importance of our brewing heritage. Whilst I'm grateful for Molson Corps' ongoing commitment to Burton, we must work collectively to maintain our town's reputation as the brewing capital of the world and secure its history for future generations. 
The petitioners therefore request that the House of Commons urge the Government to support Burton's heritage and help ensure that all the items, artefacts and archives from the National Brewery Centre in Burton-upon-Trent are kept within the town for public exhibition and the petitioners remain, etc. Petition National Brewery Centre in Burton upon Trent. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Leila Moran. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm very grateful to this House for allowing me another chance to raise the proposed reopening of Campsfield House. Immigration Removal Centre after the business was, of course, so mournfully changed two weeks ago. Uh, and may I start by just thanking the Minister for engaging with me and my office on this and answering this question today. But I am deeply disappointed that we have to be debating this issue again at all. One of my first campaigns as the parliamentary candidate for Oxford Western Abingdon was the campaign to close Campsfield House. And at the time, Campsfield was a detention centre for over 200 adult men facing deportation. My community fought tirelessly for over two decades to close the centre, and make no mistake, we are ready to fight again. The government is now planning to reopen the centre with an expanded capacity of 400 beds at the cost of £227 million to the taxpayer. Now, our opposition to the centre comes primarily from concern over the welfare of the detainees, the impact that that has on everyone in our community, but also on the cost and efficiency of this plan within the immigration detention estate. It's expensive. It does not achieve its aims. But most of all, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's cruel. And I want to start with the detainees' own descriptions of Campsfield. One man detained at the centre said, some of us have been here for over three years with no prospect of removal or any evidence of future release. There is no justification whatsoever for detaining us for such a period of time. Our lives have been stalled without any hope of living a life, having a family or having any future. Another former detainee talked about finding solace in music. He said, I tried to create a kind of musical environment around me in Campsfield. I, it genuinely helped me, so I didn't get too depressed. It saved me from self-harm and suicide, which I saw many people try. And it made me feel like I was reaching out beyond the fences. Something I think it's okay. Sometimes I think it's okay to escape reality in that kind of place because the reality there can make you feel like you're living in a nightmare. And the nightmare of immigration detention was made so much worse by failures in the processes and procedures. In 2013, I uncovered that a child was being held at Campsfield. A boy was held there for between two and three months. He would have been the only child in an adult-dominated guarded facility with barbed wire fences. He would not have been allowed to go to school, unable to, unable to interact with other children, and unable to lead any sort of normal childhood. We know very little about him other than he was between 12 and 16, and this was, and I hope everyone would agree, is totally unacceptable. But he wasn't the only one. Another boy was incorrectly identified by social services as being an adult, and he was held at Campsfield for 62 days. He was 16. The chief inspector of prison said he was held there by mistake and should never have been detained. Fine, but there is only one way to ensure that such an atrocity does not happen again at Campsfield, and that is simply not to reopen it. An accidental child detention isn't the only concern. As detainees faced unacceptable conditions, tensions would often boil over into aggression and protest, and there were riots, fires and escapes. And detainees completed suicide. One asylum seeker completed suicide at Campsfield after being detained for six months and having been denied bail three times. Mr Deputy Speaker, he was only 18 years old. And all this, as you might imagine, 
causes enormous distress to the local community. It is important to note that detention has an enormous effect far beyond the fences. And a volunteer visitor service was therefore set up by local people and became the wonderful organisation Asylum Welcome, which is now doing fantastic work supporting asylum seekers across Oxfordshire and are playing a pivotal role in welcoming Ukrainian refugees. One former visitor said, the men detained at Campsfield House were representative of a broad range of humanity. Now, not all were angels, although most I spoke to were very decent people. And they're all human and therefore deserving of human rights, and none deserve to be locked away without having committed a crime. And this is critical. Most of the detainees that passed through Campsfield were as true asylum seekers. They were not criminals. The Home Office claims Campsfield is necessary to hold foreign national offenders, yet in 2017 there was an average of only 98, 98 over the course of the year at any one time at Campsfield. So why do we need a 400-bed centre away from the main airports? Immigration detention is described by the Home Office as having a, quote, limited but crucial role in helping control our borders. And there's a stringent set of circumstances in which the government has the power to detain an individual. That is to enable removal from the country, establish the basis of someone's identity or claim, and when the Home Office suspects someone won't comply with immigration bail. The Home, Office, Home, Home Office's own guidance states that detention should be used sparingly and for the shortest possible period. On the face of it, actually that's sensible and I want to make clear to the Minister that I can see the need for a small number of detention places very close to airports for people to be held for an extremely short amount of time. That is not in question. But what is happening now with an expansion of the detention estate, starting with Campsfield, shows that there is a failure in that system. When the Chief Inspector of Prisons carried out a final inspection before Campsfield closed, the average length of detention was 55 days. But some of these men were being held for excessive periods. The longest detention in that year was one year and five months. But we have heard from detainees who have been held for over three years. And for many detainees, they are not held in one centre, but in fact they are deported, released, they move around the system, they're passed from one centre to another, not allowed to form relationships. An MP might advocate for them, they move and then they can't anymore, and they don't have consistent caseworkers. It's cruel, but it's also incredibly costly, and I think the cost element needs to be explored. When Campsfield was open, it cost £86 a day to detain someone there, but costs have increased. And in the first quarter of 2022, the average cost of holding someone in detention was £107 a day. The more individuals that we detain, the longer that we keep them behind bars, the more costly it is. And the Minister may well remember that we are in a cost of living crisis. Families are struggling to afford food. Pensioners can't afford to turn their heating on. And we've heard from this morning the Chancellor's grand plan to tackle e economic crisis. I'm sorry. But the way to solve this is not to keep detaining people at enormous cost. It is instead to invest that money in a system to improve processing times. The taxpayers deserve a Home Office that is doing its job properly. So House of Commons library figures reveal that the same amount of money the government will be spending on reopening Campsfield could be used to fund over a thousand asylum caseworkers so desperately needed to process that backlog. So it, I asked the Minister, why are we not investing this money in staff? Is, how many new caseworkers are they intending to bring into the system, or are they just now accepting failure? We raised concerns at the time about the welfare of Cansfield, but we need to also understand why there has been this shift in policy. And I think this is why this adjournment debate is so important. When Campsfield was shut in 2017, that was off the back of the Shaw Review. The Stephen Shaw Review concluded that the direction of travel for the detention estate in the UK should be downwards, both for reasons of welfare and for better use 
of public money. And the Home Office agreed with this recommendation and made a decision to reduce the estate, aiming to reduce the immigration detention estate by almost 40%. And as part of this, Cansfield closed. But now the government has changed direction. Numbers are climbing to the same levels that we saw before 2019. And not only are they reopening Campsfield, but there's another detention centre, a Haslar in Hampshire, with more beds than both centres had before. This is a clear change of policy. It's active, and we haven't had an explanation as to what has changed. Which recommendations in the Shaw Review does the Minister now not accept? How does this change of policy fulfil also their legal obligations? There have been legal challenges on human rights grounds for those who are held in the detention estate. And the fact is, most of those people, and I think this is where we have to end, most of those people are not criminals. And most of those people are true asylum seekers. And in fact, 80% of those who try to claim asylum in the UK are then granted asylum. So when you combine the fact that it is a small number of foreign prisoners who should be detained and deported. 80% of those who try to claim asylum are then granted asylum. I simply ask the minister, why are they doing this? And to reverse the decision to reopen Campsfield House. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I've listened with close interest to the debate today, and I thank um, the Honourable Lady for her contribution and for setting out her case in the way that she has, albeit um, I disagree with considerable elements of it, and I will set out the case um, from the government's perspective as to why that is. And I welcome the opportunity to respond to the points which have been made um, and which I also set out in my recent letter to the Honourable Lady. Let me first state at the outset that this government is committed to a fair and humane immigration policy, one which welcomes those who arrive legally and, crucially, one which maintains the integrity of our border and works in the interests of the people of this country. Each week we see more people arriving in the UK after crossing the Channel on small boats putting their lives at risk and putting yet more money in the pockets of the evil people smugglers who exploit them. This cannot be allowed to continue, and I've set out the arguments around this many times on the floor of the House. Our immigration system must encourage compliance with immigration rules as well as protecting the public. Immigration detention is an essential part of effective immigration control and management. It is used sparingly with 95% of people who are liable for removal from the UK managed in the community while their cases are progressed. And we continue to support people to leave voluntarily wherever possible. That work happens day in, day out. It is important that the immigration removal estate can respond to changes. We need to ensure sufficient resilience and capacity in the right locations for the men and women it is necessary to detain for the purpose of removal which is why the April announcement about tackling illegal migration made clear that the removal estate would be expanded. Our plans for the site of the former Campsfield House Immigration Removal Centre in Oxfordshire are part of that expansion. I should emphasise that it would be wrong to characterise the plans as a simple reopening. We accept that by the time the centre closed in 2018, it needed significant investment Although it is worth noting that the last report by the Local Independent Monitoring Board in 2018 found the centre to be well run. Our plans will see us investing in significant improvements to the site with a clear focus on welfare and safety. The new centre will provide decent, safe and secure accommodation for up to 400 men in detention. And I can confirm that that will not be for the purposes of detaining families. Although planning is in the early stages, the intention is to use a mix of refurbished buildings and new build accommodation on an area within the secure perimeter of the existing site. The refurbished part of the new centre will house approximately 160 people, compared to almost 300 in the previous centre. The refurbished accommodation will reflect current best practice, with most rooms being dual occupancy. Rooms in the new build accommodation will all be dual occupancy. 
All IRCs in England have dedicated health facilities run by doctors and nurses, commissioned by NHS England and delivered to the equivalent quality standards as services are in the community. NHS England will, as in other IRCs in England, be commissioning healthcare services for the centre. And what I can also just say on that point, and I visited in the previous ministerial capacity Derwent side um, in County Durham, there is a lot of learning that has gone about from the experience there. And what I can say, and I hope that this provides some reassurance too, is that a bespoke healthcare uh, offer will be developed that is appropriate to the site to meet the needs that exist. On the subject of riots, escapes, self-harm and suicide at the former Campsfield House, I want to emphasise that in developing the site, our focus is on dignity, welfare and safety. Significant improvements have been made to detention in recent years, but the programme of reforms introduced following Stephen Shaw's 2015 and 2018 reviews of welfare in detention, which the Honourable Lady quite rightly referred to. His reports, and others by external bodies, including His Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons and the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, have informed both our strategic and tactical approach to detention. The new IRC will not be operational until at least 2023, and late in 2023 at that. Our plans are at an early stage, and we are committed to listening to local and other voices. My officials have written to local stakeholders and are listening to their views. We have already met with the local parish council, and we will continue to engage with them and others over the coming months. In terms of planning and procurement of services, what I can say is that we are reaching out to the local planning authority and we've made clear that we're going out to the market to procure the services for the running of the site. We're looking for both value for money and good quality, safe and secure accommodation that meets the needs of the residents within the facility. We've held a market engagement event with interested potential bidders, with a good level of interest being shown in delivering these services. I also just want to be clear that we do not and cannot detain people indefinitely. It is not lawful to do so. The law is clear that we can only detain people where removal is a realistic prospect within a reasonable timescale or initially to establish their identity or basis of claim. This is set out in both legislation and in domestic case law. Over time, the government has necessarily adapted its strategic approach around the use of immigration detention in response to the international challenge of illegal migration and the need to break the business model of the evil people smuggling gangs. Decisions on the appropriateness of an individual's detention or continued detention are always made on a case-by-case -case basis. On the specific point that uh, the Honourable Lady raised around age-disputed children and a particular um, case that she referred to, I hope that I can offer some reassurance in saying that in some cases, individuals who are detained subsequently claim to be children. When this occurs, they will usually be afforded the benefit of the doubt and released into the care of social services until a further assessment of their age has been made, unless their physical appearance and demeanour very strongly suggests that they are significantly over 18 years, or there is ever evidence which shows that they are an adult. And I would also just refer the House to the measures that were introduced through the Nationality and Borders Act in relation to age assessment that I believe will make a considerable difference in helping to identify and to make appropriate decisions around the ages of those who claim to be children and those who are children, and we are going to deliver those reforms at the earliest possible opportunity, um, making progress because we recognise the significant safeguarding concerns that flow in both directions around being able to identify appropriately the ages of children and also just to pick up while mentioning the Nationality and Borders Act. Um, I was disappointed that the Honourable Lady and her colleagues weren't supportive of that legislation, which is arguably, in many respects, designed to try and expedite cases to ensure that people are not in detention for any longer than is necessary, to end the cycle of claims and appeals and efforts that are on occasion deployed to try and frustrate proper removal from our country because of course we want to provide certainty as quickly as possible in individual cases to make sure that we maintain a fair immigration system where those who have a right to be here are properly cared for and that that happens as quickly as possible but those who have no right to be here are removed without any needless delay that's what the reforms are aimed at achieving and I hope that moving forward as we enact them the Honourable Lady and her colleagues will perhaps take a different view. 
On detention safeguards, we have a series of detention safeguards, including the detention gatekeeper, case progression panels, and our adults at risk in immigration detention policy to ensure proper scrutiny of detention decisions on an ongoing basis. Individuals are provided with written reasons for their detention when they are detained and then at least every 28 days thereafter. This includes information about what steps have occurred in progressing their claims to remain in the UK and or in relation to their return. Individuals in immigration detention can apply for bail at any time. The use of detention is subject to rigorous scrutiny, including by the independent monitoring boards, His Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, and, of course, in the courts. I also um, just wanted to pick up on the point around visiting, and, of course, as is the case in detention facilities around the country, visiting is permitted, and arrangements will be made appropriately for individuals to allow that to happen, and I would certainly be very willing to take away um, and raise with officials the work that has been carried out in a voluntary basis in her community to try and help facilitate um, some of that work. And I thank um, the individuals who were involved in facilitating and helping to, to organise um, visitation previously in her area. Um, on, on employment opportunities, I know um, that the Honourable Member had concerns about local employment when the previous centre closed, and in particular the impact on the jobs of those working there at the time that it closed. Um, so I'm sure we are both in agreement about the benefits that opening a new centre will have in terms of creating new jobs in the area. And just to illustrate um, on the jobs side and um, the impact that these centres uh, provide, again I refer to Derwent side as a recently opened um, facility, but that is providing um, around 200 jobs in that area, and I have uh, a full expectation that this will provide um, several hundred jobs in the Honourable Lady's area too, which is not insignificant of itself. On the subject of how much this will cost, initial estimates for the operating costs were in the region of £170 million for the lifetime of the contract, as we quoted in the prior information notice we published on Wednesday the 21st of September. Actual costs will only be known once the procurement has been concluded, but the approach being taken will ensure that value for money is delivered and we anticipate costs to be less than this initial estimate. In addition to the operating costs, there will be building and refurbishment costs. I thank the Honourable Lady for her contribution today. We have begun engagement with the Council and other key local stakeholders to ensure we have a full understanding of the impact of our plans. This debate has been a welcome opportunity to hear some of those views. We will, of course, reflect on what we have heard as we develop these plans. And in the spirit of engagement, I would like to say that, as she touched on, um, I am always happy to speak to colleagues um, across the House about issues that are relevant to their constituents and to their constituencies around um, immigration matters. And that offer most certainly applies in relation to this project. Um, more widely, we will continue driving forward the reforms that are needed to make our immigration system fairer and more effective. We would argue, as a government, that that is what the public expects, and it's what we are determined to deliver. The question is that this House do now adjourn. As many of that have been say, aye. Aye. You know, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. House of Commons Sound. House of Commons Sound. House of Commons Sound.
House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. 
House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. 
House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. 
House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound. House of Commons sound.